Good morning and welcome to the second day of our Built Environment, Global Built Environment Conference. My name is Ian Richardson. I'm the sector lead at BSI. Today, our session is around quality and value. Hopefully, some or all of you joined our sessions yesterday, where Ant Bird in the morning covered health, safety, and welfare, and in the afternoon, Dan Rossiter covered cyber physical infrastructure. So, a really good day yesterday. We're hoping for a really good day today as well. As I say, I'm covering quality and value this morning between 10 and 1, and my colleague Claire Price this afternoon is going to be looking at modern methods of construction. So, as I say, quality and value, really interesting title at a time of some unprecedented challenges, both locally in the UK and globally, whether that be energy challenges or economic challenges. Quality is clearly right at the heart of all of these in terms of solutions and has become, if it wasn't before, right at the top of the agenda. So if we look at what we're going to cover today, we have a number of panelists who are going to talk you through um, some really interesting topics. Before they come online, I'll just cover the usual housekeeping rules and, and regulations. This is a listen only webinar, but we are recording it so that you will be able to watch it back. After the event is finished, you'll receive a link in an email that you can click on and go and review the, the uh, webinar. We obviously also want this to be as interactive as we can. Uh, your questions can be put into the um, Q&A function on the right hand side in your drop down. And uh, towards the end of the session, when the, all the presentations have been concluded, we will hold a short Q&A session and try and answer as many of those as we possibly can. If you do experience any technical difficulties, please submit your issue via the Q&A function and our team will endeavor to help as, as much as they can. And then once the webinar has concluded, you will get a link to a feedback survey. Uh, which we really appreciate you filling out and giving us as much feedback as you can. And then, as I say, you'll then receive the recording of the webinar in due course. This is a CPD recognized webinar. Please request your certificate via the feedback survey following the, the conclusion of the webinar. So, as I say, please do feel free. We've had some questions already, but please feel free to put any into the once uh, the, the, the presentations get going, we'll do our best to try and answer them. So as you can see, we've got a very illustrious panel of speakers today covering a broad range of topics around quality and value. Um, I shall introduce each of these guys as they go through. And uh, as I say, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them on each of the sessions and, and we will look at them at the end if we can. So first up, we have Will Hughes from Reading University. So I'll just do a quick intro into Will before he begins his presentation. Will's going to be looking at the business of construction and setting the scene for us today. Will is the Professor Emeritus at Reading University. He started in the construction industry as an unskilled labourer, progressed through college and university to follow an academic vocation. Doctorate is in organisational analysis of building projects. He's researched and written extensively on the control and management of building contracts. In 25 years, he was editor of the academic journal Construction Management and Economics, also head of the School of Construction Management and Engineering at the University of Reading, subsequently program manager for MSc Construction Management. Having retired from university, he now spent his time with national and international standards in the area of construction procurement and cataloging global research in construction management for the Association of Researchers in Construction Management. So no one better to lead us through the business of construction. And it's over to you, Will. You might be uh, you might be on on mute there, Will, if you
Yeah, we can see you, but we can't hear you at the moment. No, still can't hear you. Um, hello, hello. How's Here we that? go. Yeah, thank you very much. Good. Sorry about that. There's something a bit um, flaky about these headphones. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for that introduction. We've got a lot of ideas to get through this morning. And um, <clears throat> I want to set the scene and um, raise some areas of uh, hopefully a, a little bit of controversy. So I want to begin by thinking about the, the nature of construction. One of the things that I've noticed in conversations around the area of project management and values and sustainability and so forth is um, there tends to be quite a strong focus on clients being the beginning and end of projects. A lot of people, when they're talking about the management of construction, talk about meeting the client's requirements <clears throat> quite often as if that was the only thing that mattered. One of the most striking things, for example, about architects and um, civil engineers and their role in the design process is to often challenge what clients say they want um, and think about the responsibilities towards wider society um, and translate what clients want into something appropriate to what clients need. There can be quite a different between, difference between what people want and what people need. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, there's, um, there's been some interesting analysis about conflict in organisations generally, not just in construction. Um, and the idea that there should be no conflict seems to be counterproductive. I remember years ago, um, people in the industry in, on talking about the improvement agenda, um, claiming that we would be better off if there was less conflict. That always struck me as odd because one of the reasons that we bring in architects, engineers, surveyors and so forth into the construction project team is that each of them has a different agenda and their role is to argue passionately for their agenda. So when the designer comes up with some ideas, I would expect the surveyor not to simply ac accept them and figure out the price, a quantity surveyor, for example, cost engineer. They should be arguing for economy of form and the economy of structure. Whereas the engineer should be arguing, structural engineer would be arguing for stronger structure, bigger factors of safety and so forth. And each person in the team, I would expect to be arguing from a different point of view and that the overall management task is to bring out these different views and confront them and figure out the best way forward. But that's not the same as simply doing what the client asks for. If you agree, with everything the client says, I guess you're simply redundant. There's no need for you to even be there. And so that's always my start point when I think about how we organize projects and how we go about setting up the work. <clears throat> we often talk about the idea of procurement and procurement is one of those strange words that can mean very little or it can mean very much. Typically procurement refers to a buying function. And there is a Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply, for example, that is focused on supply and purchasing within organisations. <clears throat> and it's quite often the case that um, the procurement of buildings is way beyond anything that uh, the, um, a procurement specialist in business would be able to advise us on. Um, and often this is because um, <clears throat> the procurement of buildings is such um, a large task and a large process um, that it's the choices that are available to us are not the same as the choices when we're buying smaller things. Um, and organizing our work around projects, um, which are rather large compared to the normal work of organizations, means that um, <clears throat> we often have a very different view of what we mean by procurement. So in construction, procurement tends to mean organizing the, a, a large construction process from beginning to end. Um, and as part of that, um, we're setting up managing and fulfilling contracts. But there's much more to it than simply setting up contracts. The, the fact that construction work is based upon projects has always been a distinguishing feature. But I've learned recently that um, most organizations in most industries organize their work through projects 
And so being a project-based industry is no longer quite as distinguishing a feature as it used to be um, a few decades ago. <clears throat> so I would not say that um, project basis is a key distinguishing factor of construction. What is distinct about construction is that when we organize our work and split complex tasks into a set of related parts, um, the separation of responsibilities into different specialist areas usually means setting up contracts. And this is, this is a kind of fragmentation that people often berate the industry for. Um, but fragmentation is just a negative word for um, organization, which, as I've said, organization means splitting a whole into a series of interrelated parts. And one of the reasons we have to do that, especially in construction, is because the mix of skills and, um, and trades are different in every project. And it's difficult to keep all of that skill in-house in one organization. Um, because we'd never be able to keep them busy all the time. For the, for the sake of efficiency, we create subcontracts. And by separating responsibilities through contracts, we then have the added problem that contracts need some kind of specification of responsibility and some targets. This gets more difficult because of our multiple levels of supply chains. And in some of our research at Reading, we were discovering supply chains that were going up to um, seven levels deep of sub 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 contracting, um, <clears throat> and at every stage that um, we go to another level of subcontracting, we have to set up um, targets in terms of um, objective, uh, measurable contractual deliverables. So, what we're typically doing in construction is setting up payment for processes and inputs, rarely for outputs which means we focus our specifications on labor and material content. Um, and that's always been a, a funny thing about construction is the existence of documents like bills of quantities, which are a detailed list of labor and material content um, throughout the whole project. That requires you know, a huge amount of documentation and a huge amount of decision-making before the installer of things is brought into the process. Um, one of the other things it requires is some confidence about the future. The extended time periods of construction create a great deal of uncertainty. So these two factors that we want to specify processes and input before, it, before they take place, and we've got extended time periods, <clears throat> means that the information that we're using in construction projects is always uncertain and incomplete. And this is a real problem. Um, Again, it's usually characterized as a, a problem that's come about perhaps as carelessness or through lack of planning, but actually it's an inescapable factor um, simply because there's not enough time to document everything before it happens. And even if there was, you don't need that much information. We need sufficient information. We don't need complete information. <clears throat> and whatever we think we know now will be different next year. And the fact that construction projects might occupy um, a, a year or two years of design and then a year or two years of construction or more, it, we have no way of predicting the availability of labor, the availability of resources, the availability of materials. And we don't know what new techniques and new products are going to be emerging in the meantime. So we always build into our contracts the idea that we can change the specification as we go, not through capricious whim of a client that can't make up their mind, but to take advantage of new opportunities and new technologies as they emerge, so that when our buildings and infrastructure are finished, they're using technology that's appropriate to the time. Finally, there's a point I want to make about risk. There's risk in all business. Um, and I've, throughout my career, I've been told that humans are risk averse. Um, and I don't believe that because I spent a large portion of my life riding very large, fast motorcycles. Um, and I realized that um, people love taking risks. That's why they play sport. It's why they, they take on um, dangerous hobbies. And it's why people go into business. Um, if you wanna make money, you have to put your capital at risk. The whole purpose of business is to subject yourself to risk. But 
we do want to control it in some way. We've all got thresholds of risk. That doesn't mean we want to avoid risk completely and wrap ourselves in cotton wool. It means that we make informed decisions about how much risk we want to be exposed to um, <clears throat> and how we um, cover ourselves um, for, for financial risks. The problem with construction is that financial risk is an existential threat for both parties, especially in the private sector, in that projects are so big, they can wipe out your business. Um, and there's plenty of examples of large, well-established contractors, for example, Lang comes to mind, um, who were wiped out by one bad project. Um, and so the turnover of a main contractor is often smaller than the contract value of the projects that they're involved with. So risks present an existential threat. So it's not simply a matter <clears throat> of planning for contingencies. Um, it's a matter for thinking about the planning of contingencies in a way that you're not wiping out the business. And if one interesting thing happens with risk, which is uh, quite often people talk about uh, the, the idea that the best place to put the risk in a project is with the firm that's best placed to handle it. And I've seen that quite frequently written down. And um, it took me a long time to figure out what that actually meant in practical terms. Um, and I've realized that what it means is really the best place to put the risk in the, in the supply chain, in the buying and supplying, is by thinking about the frequency with which people engage with the risk. So if I'm having construction work done to my house as a private individual, it's not something I do very often. Therefore, I would transfer that risk to the contractor. All of the supply and coordination risks, I would want to transfer to the contractor. The contractor would add a contingency in um, to cover for that risk. And then if something goes wrong, they spread that risk across a number of different projects. And so I don't have to worry about it in the same way as insurance works. I pay an insurance premium and an insurance company um, covers um, my risk based upon the premiums they've collected from everybody. If on the other hand, I'm frequently building, if I was a property developer building all the time, it's uneconomic to transfer risk because I would be paying for a contingency plus overheads and profit. Um, and it doesn't make economic sense to transfer that risk. If I've got 20 projects that I'm developing and there's a one in 20 risk that something crazy is going to happen, I'm, it's more economical for me to take that risk and for me to build up that contingency. But then one thing that impacts upon that is the economic cycle. Because if a contractor is hungry for work, they won't price for risk. Because if they price for risk, they wouldn't win the project. So when you get price competition, you get the famous race to the bottom. Nobody's got any contingency in the supply chain, which means um, <clears throat> everything's up for grabs and it all becomes a bit of a Wild West show. Um, in a boom part of the economy, then the situation's different. Contractors can pick and choose the work that they want, they can price for the risks, and if a project's too risky, they simply would price themselves out of the competition. So I very rarely see discussions of the um, economic cycle in discussions about risk, and I very rarely see discussions about frequency of engagement. Most of the conversation about risk is some vague notion that we, oh, give it to the people who are best able to handle it, and conversations about magnitude of the exposure and probability of things happening. There's very rarely conversations about frequency and the economic situation. So I think that um, risk is more complicated than many people um, like to think. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I've got out of sequence with the slides. Um, so I've covered these factors already. Um, except that the project management focus on delivery. Um, quite frequently, the definition of project management is the achievement of the client's requirements in terms of time, cost, and quality. Um, I've always been uncomfortable with that because it's such um, an objective and uh, almost um, bland um, set of targets in relation to the, the scale of things like um, 
new highways and um, opera houses, museums, um, housing developments, town centres and so forth. Now, most of the buildings and infrastructure that we look at, we've completely forgotten what the construction time, cost and quality were. Time, cost and quality are simply delivery targets for project managers inwardly looking at the management of contracts. You have to have these targets in order to determine whether somebody's discharged their contractual responsibilities. But construction is about much more than simply discharging contractual responsibilities. That project management focus <clears throat> is very necessary for inwardly looking at the control of projects, but there's more to construction than that. Um, so, and in any event, effective control involves the adjustment of targets. So a control system is to do with having a plan, mon monitoring progress according to that plan, but also scanning the external environment to see if departures from the plan are advantageous or disadvantageous, because it may be better to change the plan rather than bring the work back onto the original target. So the hallmark of project success, yes, is of hitting targets, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the original targets that were set were the right ones as time passes. But the project manager who has a responsibility for delivering to target um, may not be the right role for changing the targets as things change. So there's another role, a client focused role in the process um, that would be focused upon changing targets if necessary. Now, what I want to do with this complex diagram is to actually try to organize some of those ideas into a scheme where we could actually do something about all of this. Because in terms of activities, there's a series of things that we do in relation to the built environment, constructing, installing things, maintaining things, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and the things that we've built are constantly being influenced by the environment within which we're operating. Now, when we set up a project, we set up project controls. Um, and we have project controls in relation to budget, quality, schedule, the traditional time, cost, and quality. But we also have to control conflicting agendas of the kind that I was talking about earlier, where we bring different people in to the decision making because they've got different ideas and different agendas. So the idea of managing conflict, like the idea of managing expenditure, is not that you want zero, it's that you want some, but you don't want it to get out of control. Um, similarly, we need to control safety, health and environment, and project governance issues um, become part of the project management um, purview. So there are system boundaries between these project controls and the activities that take place, and these are managed by the project delivery team. There are standards about this, such as ISO 21502 on project management. There's a whole range of standards that go along with that, that help us to have that project focus. But within this context of project controls, there are then organizational constraints. There are limits to what we can do. There are laws and regulations that society has set up to limit our behaviors to what has been determined through democratic processes to be socially acceptable. Similarly, there's organizational governance limited, limits, limitations. So with any, within any organization that is involved in the procurement of construction, they have got governance issues that they have to keep in mind and organizational values. And each organization has its own set of values. What we would hope is that the things that we are building contribute to the client organization's values. And the organizational procurer has financial policy and technology constraints. Now, all of this exists in an underlying context of society, ethics, culture, economics, politics, and the physicality of the environment. And, and it's this underlying context that has been, been growing significantly in recent years through our growing consciousness of sustainability issues, the UN sustainability development goals, um, the need for ethics and so forth. And so there are standards about 
managing that system boundary between the external environment and what an organization does in its day-to-day -day work. Um, an ISO 37000 on governance in organizations is a very significant step forwards in managing that. And what we have noticed in our work in developing standards for the management of construction procurement is that there's a gap in advice and guidance at this interface in the middle between the organizational constraints and the project controls. Um, <clears throat> and this is a boundary that's managed by the client delivery management team, which is not the same as the project delivery management team. So in terms of the way the client relates to the project, um, there's this whole area of delivery management, which is what we're currently focusing on in the development of our procurement standards, which is currently a provisional work item, number 60882, which is about construction project governance and delivery management of projects. So that's where we're at at the moment in terms of our thinking on the procurement standards. And it's this kind of diagram that helps us to marshal all of these different ideas and different levels of analysis that we have found quite useful. Um, so in terms of setting the overall scene, um, what I also wanted to do was to briefly skim through the types of standards that already exist um, and there's rather a lot of these, and I'm not going to go through all of this list in detail, um, but I'm raising these here because I just want to bring to the attention of the audience um, things they may not necessarily know about yet, in that there are standards like ISO 10854, which is what um, the people I'm involved with are doing. These are the focuses, focusing on tendering and selection, you know, the, the close definition of procurement of the setting up, the, the management and the fulfillment of contracts. We've also developed strat strat strategy and tactics for construction procurement, which is about managing um, the procurement function. And we're currently working on this construction project governance area in PWI 6082. But we're interfacing with standards on design management, standards about workmanship, quality management, um, the PASS 3980, which these, these areas we'll be looking at later on this morning as well. PASS 91, which many people are aware of um, about pre-qualification. If I move on to the next slide, there are standards on governance to do with organizations, compliance issues with management systems. Um, there's um, a project governance standard in this 21,000 series and there's standards on public sector procurement and social management systems. We've got a whole range of standards on sustainability um, and uh, thinking about the impact that we're having on the environment um, and how we manage that. There's a bunch of standards on the management of projects because this is a very well rehearsed and well articulated area of knowledge. Um, there's standards on quality, value and risk um, and there's a whole range of those. And there are standards on setting up transactions. Um, I seem to have listed PAS 91 again here. Um, there's a framework for specifying performance. There are standards about establishing collaborative business relationships, which has been a very important agenda in the construction sector recent, in recent um, decades now. Um, I was surprised to find that there are already standards on, on this area, on how we set up collaborative business relationships. And there's standards, obviously, on information management, especially in relation to BIM, but also in terms of visibility of what's happening in extended supply chain processes. So <clears throat> where that leaves me is ideas about the kind of construction specific issues that might be missing from these generic business standards. Um, and I think this is largely an issue that technical committees in standards drafting need to need to focus upon and it's something that i'm often asking if there's already a standard on governance in organizations for example do we need a sector specific standard on governance in construction organizations or does that governance stuff already apply as it stands the second area is how drafters of standards take account of interfaces and overlaps um, between as you can see from the lists that i've just quickly dashed through there's a lot of overlaps. There are similar topics that dealt with in, in, in different with different agendas. And I'm interested 
from a user's point of view in how inclusive or exclusive each standard should be in providing guidance. Because to be honest, I'm a bit horrified. In our work on the provisional work item 6082 on governance in projects, we're referencing 49 existing standards, which is a heck of a landscape to try and navigate. And recently we've been, I've been involved um, with some very interesting work on BS 99001, um, creating this sector specific implementation of ISO 9001. And that did make me wonder whether all generic business standards require sector specific implementations. Um, and if not, why not? How do we make that decision? And finally, how would anybody new to these standards decide which ones relate to their specific interests? Even how would you afford to buy them all? Some of them cost. 250 pounds. And if you need 50 different standards, that's a hell of a package to buy and even more difficult to discover them, unearth them, read them and understand them. Um, so I'm a little bit worried about this. And um, that's one of the issues that I'd like the audience and the panel to consider today. OK, that's me, Don. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Yeah, I, I mean that's interesting, isn't it? Your last, uh, your your last question. I don't know if you want to go back one slide, if you if you can, because I think holding yeah. those for consideration up on the screen, just while you and I are chatting before we move to the next session in a couple of minutes. But I mean, having worked for a national standards body and a, a, a standards development organisation like BSI for for almost 20 years, I, I think we have been on the journey that you're describing. And in terms of question four, if you're asking people to link together 49 <coughs> standards at quite considerable cost, you know, if I was talking in, with my commercial hat on, I would lead people to our British Standards Online um, option where that does take away the sort of individual purchase of each of those single standards. But again, you're talking probably about the size of organization who can afford that. So yeah, that is definitely something we've been mindful of. In fact, touching on 99,001, for example, that we're gonna talk about next, it links so closely to 9,001, you literally couldn't use it unless you already had a copy of 9,001. So I think that's where we start to think about product development being a little bit more creative that we produce PD 99001, which is an amalgamation of all those requirements. So again, going to your third question there, you know, if you start to have sector specific implementation standards, uh, you know, linking to generic business standards, again, you're doubling the number of standards. So without tackling that in the next few minutes, what I wrote down as you were speaking was the words enormity of the task. That was, you know, perhaps when we're talking about safety, risk, procurement, time, cost, quality, a lot of the philosophy of the Global Bill Environment Conference that we're in day two of right now is about trying to give people some help. So what would you say, depending on where people are in their journey, of course, and, and whether people are coming to this new or feel like they've been doing it for a while and know what they're talking about, is, is there some advice you could give about a starting point for people in everything that you've covered? Is this about communication within an organization or your peers or BSI and the technical committees? What what would be your nugget of, of advice for people starting out on this journey? Interesting. Um, <clears throat> before I talk about advice, I, my one thing that I've learned is, as you say, the enormity of the task that constructs that, that confronts people who are constructing. And you know, if I had a hat on, I'd take it off to building contractors. It's you know, all of these things I've covered. This is the day-to-day -day business of contractors. And um, it, it, when I've visited contractors with my students um, on major city centre sites, it's incredible the sophistication of the process, the the generosity and sophistication of the people managing the project working in these contracting firms is just incredible to observe they're so knowledgeable and patient and well informed it's incredible and i don't think that gets out much into the public there's, there's a there's a huge um 
lack of information in the general public about what contractors and engineers actually do and how they sift through this mountain of information um, and we just keep society just keeps throwing more things at us in terms of you've got you've got responsibilities here manage this as well so <clears throat> i think the scale of the management task needs to be properly acknowledged the successful contractors figure it out and they do it and they bring in some amazing people to help them manage it um, the problem is especially difficult for smaller projects and smaller contractors who still have these agendas to deal with but they don't have the management resource to deal with it but so there's a there's a this my advice is to think very carefully about the scale of the management task and how that management task varies in different sizes of project so you don't apply the same amount of management to every project big projects need a proportionally larger amount of management simply because the stakeholder network that they're dealing with is so much bigger so it, it grows disproportionately and i don't think our pricing and our modeling of these processes takes sufficient account of the information and management demands so that would be my advice just to think more carefully about those yeah i think that's that is good advice <clears throat> and just talking about the standards development side we've got a minute or so before we move to the next session you know, as somebody involved with standard setting committees, I guess interaction with those processes. Um, I think one of the standards you said was a was a work in progress, the, the, the standard of construction governance. So, <clears throat> what we'd encourage people, and I presume you would agree, is to try and interact with that process as early as possible. BSI has a standards development portal that you can go to to see what work is under underway. And then also at, at the point of it going out for public comment, you can make comment on the draft as it stood around halfway through the process and start to give your opinion on how you would think these in reality could could be could be used. And is that something in, in perhaps your first two questions there you'd encourage people to do? Well, absolutely. From the point of view of a drafter of standards, <clears throat> I would love to get input from potential users before it's finished. Um, if, if a standard is missing the point, if it's too complex or oversimplified, I'd, I'd prefer to learn that during the drafting process rather than after it's published. So the more input that we could get, the better. And I do think that people who aren't involved in standards don't realize that there's that intermediate thing. It's not a binary thing, being involved or not being involved. There's, there's this range in between when, as, as, without fully committing to being involved in drafting, you can take a moment and see what's currently bubbling up and have a quick look and just make a suggestion as to whether this is on target or not. That would be marvelous, yeah. Absolutely, and I think you know, that's probably a good point for us to stop, Will. Thank you so much yep. for your Thank you. presentation. Really fascinating stuff, and it certainly has set the scene for us. So, uh, without further ado, we will get over to my colleague Raoul Shah, Sector Development Director for EMEA in the built environment at BSI. With over 23 years of experience, Raoul has worked with asset owners, main contractors, architects, engineers, and manufacturers, gaining experience of leading various innovation and digital initiatives on a diverse range of products, projects, including large-scale multi-billion pound urban regeneration schemes through to hospitals, airports, residential and commercial. He's gained a thorough understanding of the risks and opportunities faced by today's global construction businesses. And in his current role at BSI, he supports clients across EMEA in sustainability, digital safety, quality and supply chain. Quite a lot to, to tackle there, Raoul. So without further ado, I shall let you introduce your panel and we have a conversation hopefully here around quality management and the BS 99001, which Will touched on in his presentation and we talked about a little bit, published in July this year, brand new national standard to support ISO 9001, giving added value and extra requirements for the industry around quality management. So I'm really interested to hear your panel discussion with the, the three panel members you have there. I shall hand over to you to moderate that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Um, good morning, all. And uh, thanks for joining the panel. Um, 
we heard uh, from uh, Will, I think Will made a very interesting uh, interesting point uh, towards the end there that we have various sort of business systems and interfaces, you know, with, with the system and a uh, great sort of list of standards and international best practices to help us. But then how can we sort of integrate all of that? And also we heard that, um, you know, typically it has been when it comes to construction projects, is you know, time, cost and quality kind of parameters. And and how do we then zoom into that that integration of everything? And as Ian said, quality is, is at the heart of majority of the challenges and opportunities that, that we face today in the sector. So let's hear from our expert panels today. So if I could please request our panelists to come online, turn on their camera. So we have, while they're coming online, we have uh, Stefan Spear, Technical Director from Morgan Sindel. Hello, Stefan. Um, uh, we have Adrian Sarkundi, Corporate Responsibility Director from uh, Worker Vessels uh, UK, and Rob Keynes, Innovation Manager from HS2. Good morning, you all. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning, Ralph. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining. We heard, uh, we heard from Will and Ian about uh, the importance of quality in the sector. And, and you know the complex nature of the construction that we operate in. I mean, you you all operate. You are the practitioner. You you're leading that. You know, and and, and living and breathing uh, day in day out. Um, so we are really really interested in hearing your thoughts as you lead those quality initiatives. Uh, you know, on on construction projects. Um, so if we could please begin the conversation. First, starting with, you know, what comes to your mind when somebody says quality, right? What does quality mean to you and your business? And, and before you answer that question, if you could please briefly introduce your role to the audience, that would be also great. And if I could request Stefan, um, you to start with, that would be great. Hi, thanks, Raul. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, Raul, I'm the technical director at Morgan Syndrome Construction. So we're part of the Morgan Sindel Group. Uh, we're a leading construction organization. In our construction division, we employ around 1,300 people. And our purpose is to create inspiring places that enhance the communities in which we all live, learn, work, play, care, and protect. So it's not just about the buildings that we're constructing today, but it's the impact that those buildings have on the lives of the users on a daily basis right across the UK. Um, the technical director, I've got an interesting role, it's a really in, uh, exciting one because I get the opportunity to lead business improvement activities, which includes innovation, digital construction, project management, and finally quality. So I've got a very, very busy role. Um, and I was also a part of the 99001 drafting committee. So uh, it was great to be involved in that and hopefully shape it for the right purposes. Thank you, Stefan. So yeah, if you could please, you know, um, instead of maybe doing a round of introduction, you know, Stefan, if we stay with you now and then say, you know, what comes to your mind, you know, what does quality mean to you and in your business uh, then? Uh, right, okay. Well, if we can start with the definition of quality, um, I believe the, the 9000 suite defines it to uh, uh, the degree to which a set of characteristics of an object fulfills requirements. Um, so that means that the definition of quality uh, is variable. So what quality means to you and me can be different. Um, but I'm certain that we would all agree that achieving a particular defined standard, such as the building regulations, for example, is not a variable. We, we, we must achieve that standard. Um, and there's challenges uh, in achieving uh, quality across all aspects of the, the construction process, whether it be design, whether it be construction, whether it be maintenance. And in part, that could be because quality can be implied as variable. So 
in 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 our kind of organization and thinking about quality quality is about culture it's about getting it right but it's about achieving a particular standard um and uh, the compliance to that particular standard um we was talking about um the, the the kind of the conflict between the different uh, functions within construction, whether it be uh, design engineers, um, buyers, uh, quantity surveyors, I think you mentioned it in in his, his his kind of talk, and yeah, each one of those can have a different kind of thinking on what quality means, and it's only when we collaborate, we communicate, we bring together everybody's thoughts on what quality actually means, can we achieve those requirements as to what our customers are wanting uh, and i do agree as well between the want and need what will was talking about as two different things but achieving uh, quality in all of those places where we live learn work play and care for um it, it it can be challenging because of that variable uh, uh, kind of definition um, thank you stefan thank you Adrian, I know when we spoke about, you know, uh, before these, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, you had quite a, a sort of strong views on that as well, you know, how everything comes together in terms of supporting, you know, that, 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 that wider sort of quality sort of agenda. So yeah, if you could please share briefly, what does it mean to you, quality and your business, and briefly introduce yourself as well, please, that would be great. Sure. I'm actually tempted to talk to Will more about some of the things he was stressing at the end there, because I think he's hit the nail on the head. But yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Adrian Sharkandi, and I'm Corporate Responsibility Director uh, at Bulk and Vessels UK. Uh, so we are a group of UK construction contractors. Uh, within the UK, we have a turnover in the region of uh, uh, 1.2 billion, uh, working across multiple aspects of the built environment from infrastructure to commercial buildings. And we're part of a, of a bigger global group as well. Uh, my role, amongst other things, includes oversight of our integrated management systems across our UK businesses. I do, however, have other group wide duties for other areas such as safety, sustainability occupational health, fleet and facilities, to name a few, uh, all of which give me uh, great insight, I think, into a range of business concerns, particularly when you um, come to consideration of, of quality. I've been in the business for 17 years and, and, and 25 years in construction. And throughout that time, I've held this firm belief that you know, quality of the process should, should be invisible. I'm a firm believer that quality underpins everything that we do. And, you know, at Bulk of Us as UK, we, we do have it, you know, tucked away in our core values uh, in, in a couple of places. But I think as, as Stefan was saying, we was talking about culture. You know, we try and build quality into our ethics and guide our decisions, actions and their behaviours. And, you know, we're striving to achieve, you know, best in class in delivery but also in terms of quality and, and people. When touching on you know, some of the things that, that, that Will was talking about earlier and, and all the systems that we find ourselves facing, which we'll, which we'll come on to, it's important that the, the systems that we have within quality and what it means to us, they're, they're all about getting the relevant information that's required by the person that needs it. You don't saturate them uh, with processes that they don't need to know. It's, it's very easy to do that, uh, to, to oversaturate people, saturate the information. We're presently having a bit of a renewed focus uh, on quality, particularly with the launch of the, the new standards, uh, 99001. Uh, and Ian made reference to the, the PD version of that, which shows the relationship directly with 9001. So I, I do recommend that version of the standard in particular. But where we're at on quality at the moment is, you know, that is, is very much linked to a drive around non-conformance. Some of that might sound strange, but, you know, reinvigorating that using some new dig digital tools developed internally. And that's part of our strategy to, to raise the profile of quality and also have regular conversations at our UK board. 
Thank you, Adrian. That was great. And you know, I just I just made a note of that tagline you just use. You know, quality, you know, is underpins everything you do. And at work, 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 brilliant. Great to hear. And we'll start. You know, we'll unpack that a little bit. You know, as we move into the conversation as well. So thank you, uh, Rob. Um, if I could come to you, man. I know you've been driving a lot of uh, innovative. Uh, you know, sort of effort, innovation and HS2 and the industry-wide leading on that effort. Uh, it'd be great to hear from you, you know, what does quality mean to you and your business? And if you could please briefly introduce yourself, that would be great as well. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so I'm Rob Cairns, I'm Senior Innovation Manager for HS2. Um, and HS2 is, is the UK's largest, the government's largest investment into UK transport infrastructure um upwards of 100 billion pound program so huge investment um huge undertaking as we build the railway line moving from london through to manchester um which means that we have lots of joint ventures that are working on the program to support the delivery which brings lots of complexity to, uh, alongside that as well um, as an organization hs2 is about 1600 people um across our entire supply chain it's upwards of 30,000. Um, we've now got over 300 sites mobilized. Um, we are progressing through the build stages. Um, some of the starts of, start of those build stages is due to be completed by, by 2025, um, which is why the quality of the build is equally as important to the cost schedule um, and all other and safety, all other elements that we are sort of focused on delivering. The, the quality side of things is built into the delivery. It's part of our requirements, our sponsor requirements set out by the Department of Transport and Central Government. Um, that's our contract with them to deliver on the agreement that we have set in place. And that flows down to our supply chain to make sure all the undertakings and assurances are delivered in the manner that we would expect. So having a framework and standards in place ensures a common language from the client all the way down to the lower tiers of the supply chain. And, and picking back on Will's points, you know, we have client tier one um, and then a, a very large supply chain working on the program. So the standards and policies that you know, we've touched on already and i'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more are, are critical to ensuring that we have an integrated approach to delivery it's not just the client view and the contractors deliver on what we say the way we've we structured ourselves is is much more of an integrated approach to ensure that we can deliver on on quality as well as time and cost and everything else that is so important to delivery of infrastructure programs I see. No, thank you. Thank you, Rob. And great to hear that, you know, having that common language sort of supports that integrated approach on such a large sort of infrastructure project and 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 working with thousands of suppliers and, you know, the supply chain. Right. So um, I, I, yeah, I would love to come back to you, Rob, on that one and unpack that a little bit, you know, uh, as we move forward. How do you go about that? But um, um, Adrian, um, you know, you mentioned you mentioned BS ninety nine thousand one. You know, uh, in, in your introduction uh, comments, um, but also you, you say that you already have you know sort of a matured quality sort of management framework you had before you started embracing this new sort of standard. Um, we've also seen some uh, other developments in the industry, such as Building Safety Act. Uh, uh, we would hear from. Uh, uh, Cliff Smith, I think later today about Geary, you know, and all that get it right, you know, sort of initiatives. And, and of course, you mentioned the BS 99001. Um, how do you think this can help you and your business and your supply chain uh, in improving quality even further, Adrian? And, and, and any examples that you can maybe share with the audience, that would be great as well. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I think it, when when comparing them, you know, all of those that you mentioned there, you know, the Building Safety Act, Geary, and and uh, and new standard. I think for me, the the commonality uh, or the key aspect, I think, that comes in the Building Safety Act is around the, one of the obligations around. The, it talks about this golden thread, 
of building information th throughout the life cycle of, of particularly the higher risk buildings. And, and, and I think that's a common thread and common challenge to, to us as an organisation and the industry. You know, what the Act in, in placing does in placement requirements on duty holders around keeping you know, vital safety information about the design, build and, and management up to date. I think that's an opportunity to ensure that concept is reinforced throughout all aspects of the built environment and it's not just to what the, the Building Safety Act is, is trying to um, or, or trying to achieve. And, and it ties into you know, other aspects, the information management principles of the BIM standard in 19650, and where that talks about you know, common data environments and managing workflow approaches to information management. And, and that also is about driving a, a golden thread of, of information. If you take this step further, you know, with the introduction of, of 99,001, you mentioned about us embracing it. It was you know, probably more bracing than embracing, I think, the, the stage one assessment. Um, but there is a, you know, there's a massive shift in focus within the, that standard when it talks about interested parties. I think one of the evenings I was reflecting after a, a day of the assessment and I actually looked at the standard again and the term interested parties appears 44 times in 99,001 and it only appears seven times in the clauses of, of, of 9,001. That's even when you take it out of all the headings. And I think that's a significant shift around information management that comes back to that golden thread. Then it kind of brings us on to you know, the importance of Geary and I'm not wanting to steal what Cliff's going to talk about later, but the, the importance of proper information management is key to removing error. You know, it's information, 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 and getting the information workflow correct uh, and ensuring that the right people get the right information at the right time. And if you get that wrong, obviously, there's potential for error. And all of these you know, requirements are driving consistency and innovation, but it's also important that we as an organisation have our mechanisms in order before we enforce controls in our supply chain. And I mean, whilst I'm not necessarily going to go through any specific examples, it's more around the experiences of, of, of aligning all of these requirements. It's that, you know, I guess the final point for me on this is that no matter, no matter how smart a system we, we create, we can't lose sight of the fact that organisations are, are formed of people and people are individuals and, and, and all of these systems you know, must bring consistency to quality and create an environment where we're promoting, you know, the intuity of people around the decisions that are fully informed, they have the right information, because that's that's what we want. You know, I like this term about you're not paid by the hour, you're paid for what you bring the hour, bring to the hour, and and, and that's quite important in terms of quality of management in business. You know, <clears throat> thank thank you, Adrian. Um, uh, that's what I was quite fascinating to hear that how you see this whole 99,001 gluing, you know, various systems and um, uh, one clear sort of, uh, you know, that 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 um, uh, change you see, not change, but improvement, you know, from a generic 9,001, you know, generic quality management system to 99,000 is that the emphasis on interested parties, you know, 44 times you mentioned, you know, if I'm not wrong. So that, 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 that that's great. Thank, thanks for uh, sharing that. Um, Stefan, you you mentioned that you were involved right from day one in this whole, you know, this new framework development 99001. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to hear your thoughts in terms of how do you see this helping you and your business in terms of taking quality uh, further in your business, in your supply chain, Stefan? Well, <laughs> I feel 99,001, um, particularly one of the challenges that we were foreseeing when we was, was drafting it, and it's, it's something that will, and Ian kind of alluded to, and then Adrian has in terms of the amount of information that, that's out there and the number of standards that are out there in, in, in the ISO suite. What I was keen on was ensuring that uh, 99,001 and 9,001 could be read together because part of the challenge, and I'm sure we're going to, we're going to be talking about challenges of achieving quality uh, later on this morning, 
but part of the challenge is the amount of the information that's out there and adrian's alluded to that uh, and we we need to keep that information consumable we need to ensure that it's um available to the right people at the right time as adrian has said and, and other learned uh, practitioners have, have said the same but what i like about 99001 is it's specific to the construction industry it's specific to the fact that the way that the construction industry works quite frequently if if not always is around projects so 99001 helps with 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 those specific projects so um and especially if you've got a jv so whereby in in that joint venture one organization might have their own integrated management system whereas another one might have a, their own and therefore the challenge was always well which one do you use 99001 enables you to decide right well we're just going to have the one and we're going to comply with 99001 so that's helpful but what i i really like about 99001 as well is it starts to draw into the other standards and makes the reader or user of that standard aware as to what other available standards in the built environment are, are there so it makes reference to um the the 19650 for example uh, in information management that adrian has mentioned it helps you it points you to the right place to help you get that management system right in the first place and it certainly definitely puts an emphasis on all of those interested parties it points them out and gets you thinking about well Will said, we know that in quality, there's a difference in opinion as to what quality might mean from me to you. 99,001 gets you to think about those challenges of all of those interested parties as to what does it mean and how do you set your processes up to deliver those fantastic projects that we're all involved in. <clears throat> Thank you, Stone. It's great to hear that, you know, how 99,000, um, uh, you know, starts to draw in, you know, all the various systems and, you know, all the framework, like you mentioned, ISO 19650 for info management. I hear, you know, that that a lot, you know, Adrian, you mentioned that as well, that it's about having that right information, right time, right people, isn't it? You know, it's the information uh, having that. Um, so that, that that's great to hear. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Um, Rob, in, in, in your role at HS2, you deal with innovation and, you know, supporting innovation SMEs and, you know, the wider industry you're leading on. So on the pioneering work, such as, you know, the Innovation Accelerated Program and things like that. And, and we have seen, uh, you know, parallel in the industry advancements in, you know, the conversation, for example, modern methods of construction, you know, this afternoon, there is you know, the whole session on that, but also we've seen you know, digital technologies, you know, and, and, and so forth. Uh, you are at the forefront of that, Rob. How do you see innovation playing a role in driving quality even further in the sector, Rob, uh, in, 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 in your experience? That's a great question. Um, I, I think with a lot of the solutions that we're seeing on, on, on HS2, some of them are focused around modern methods of construction so uh, concrete 3d printing uh, spray lining techniques um, lots of utilization of, of low carbon um, prefab offsite um, the other side of things really focuses more on digital and with digital comes a plethora of data and information and um, data and information is great if you know what to do with it and if, if I tie that into the quality space, for, there are sort of three focus areas that we have on HS2 of, of supporting our, uh, our quality control, and it's all focused on control. Um, so the control management, the policies, objective plans, um, processes, procedures, everything that's put in place to help us manage quality um, and compliance of all of our requirements. <clears throat> Then there's, as a client, we have to assure the work that's undertaken by our supply chain. We tend to do that by like a 10% sample check to make sure that they are compliant and they're assured, we're assuring 
their work so we have confidence in their quality and then finally it's around improvement and um, so it's identifying and analyzing where those um, performance measures are within the program uh, removing the waste um, and the data information that we don't need to focus on and instead implementing processes new ways of working data information that can make us smarter and they can hone in so um, it can be you know it is challenging to identify the right opportunities to focus on that will give us the right data and information where we can generate an insight that would lead to a manager department business making an informed decision over the quality of that data and information that's being um, derived and i think that is without doubt the biggest opportunity that the construction industry have of delivering a step change by having much better understanding of the data and information that is being collected through the BIM models, through the digital solutions that are put in site, through the monitoring of, of um, buildings and, and the infrastructure. Um, and historically, we you know, the, the industry hasn't been you know, necessarily leading on understanding what to do with data information. Great at generating it, but then turning that into an actionable insight is where I think the, the the innovation can start to really, really add some value across across our program and across wider industry. Now, <clears throat> thank you, Rob. Uh, great to hear that that you know t taking data and and turning that into actionable insights, and this is where uh, innovation you know can play a role in terms of you know that 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 wider you know that 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 that, that ton of data you know, coming into this large program and then how can you sort of consolidate and 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 and, and generate that actionable sort of insights. Great, great to hear. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, Stephen, you mentioned that in your role at Morgan Sindel, um, you are also uh, responsible for other sort of initiatives like BIM and digitizations and other, qual you know, innovation as well. Um, any any thoughts from from you, Stefan, on that? How can innovation play a role, or is already playing in your organization supply chain, driving quality further? Oh, gosh, Raul, um, where do you start? Um, I think innovation and, and technology, uh, as I've said, is a absolutely is a, is a huge topic, um, and uh, every day in in uh, in my role, honestly, I, I get uh, contacted by different vendors of different technical uh, solutions, technology, every day. And if I had a pound for every time I was contacted by somebody to say, no, we've got this wonderful new app, it's going to change the world, um, I, I probably wouldn't be sat on this webinar now. I'd have my feet up somewhere in the Bahamas or something because it, it, it is... It is such a, um, an ever-changing environment that that people are seeing, and and I think these tech vendors, they are definitely recognising that the construction industry was behind the curve, so they're seeing it as a new entrant, a new market for them, and that they're, they're um, that's why, to be honest with you, we're probably getting flooded with different things that's out there, which can be distracting. So you've got to be very, very careful in terms of what um, innovation and what technology you are looking at to ensure that the quality agenda is not getting missed. So that's my first kind of um, uh, uh, thought on it. However, um, when you do get technology right, um, it's absolutely fantastic because it really, really does help with the information flow um, and it helps getting the right information to the right people. There are challenges around that, though, uh, uh, as well, Rahul, in, in respect of the workforce. When you're a manager and you're out on the site and you've got your iPad, for example, and you're going around and you're seeing augmented reality, which means you can actually see your design in the, in the real wide world on your site, so you can see where there are errors. You can immediately you can see stuff that's going on. The BIM environment enables the designers to get it wrong quicker, but also to get it right quicker because they can put it right quicker at the touch of a button. Like in the the days when I started my career off with CAD, that was just coming about. Um, so 
there's so much stuff that's making information more accessible. Now, the problem with making that information more accessible is not all of the right information is getting to the right people because it's so easy to click a button and say, there you go, you've got everything. Now, that's not helpful because that's when errors are going to come about and people are going to make the wrong mistakes and there's conflict between one standard against another standard. Um, and the workforce don't always have the technology that you, you the, the uh, organizations may have got. And that's because the way things are procured um, through the different tiers of supply chain. And some people don't want to use it. It might be technophobes for whatever reason. Um, so there's a cultural kind of aspect to getting the right technology into the right hands to help us drive that quality agenda. Um, is it going to help us? The Building Safety Act is here. It's now. Uh, um, it, it comes into force properly, um, fully April 24, I think it does. And as Adrian was mentioning, there's a golden thread of stuff there. There's digital twins. There's all, all, all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and it actually calls for all of this information to be held digitally. We can't do that without technology. So we've got to grab hold of it. We've got to use it. It will help, in my opinion. It's certainly helping in, in our organization, for sure. It's helping us get the quality agenda right. It's helping us um, achieve those objectives of on time. You know, um, it's even helping uh, in, in some respects with technology around the, the delivery of, of, of safe um, buildings and helping with um, the transactional safety of keeping people safe, irrespective of the building safety kind of act, which for me is around quality. So technology uh, and innovation and offsite, all of it really, really is going to help us going forward and driving that quality culture and quality mindset and quality agenda. Thank you, Stefan. And I'm so delighted that you are here with us on this webinar and not in Bahamas. So thank you for choosing this webinar over Bahamas. That's really too. Um, but great to hear that that uh, you know that uh, yeah you know whilst technology can and does already you know help you innovation, but make sure that uh, you know people don't get distracted by the you know the shiny piece of kit or you know the new toys. In the focus has to be the core quality, getting the better outcomes, quality, safe, sustainable sort of assets, right? And 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 ensure that whilst we're doing all these things, that uh, people's lives, you know, that that we safeguard, you know, people and safety and all those things. So great to hear. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Rob, you mentioned in your uh, initial introduction, you know, the, 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 the largest infra project in the UK, HS2, and thousands and thousands of suppliers that you're working with, right? The supply chain, large supply chain, and um, you're working it. Um, help me understand that. How do you, how do you go about, um, I know you touched upon that very briefly, uh, but how do you go about achieving your sort of quality aspiration on such a large infrastructure project? Uh, with such a large supply chain and wider, if I use this phrase correctly, wider interested parties, as Adrian and Stefan, we all of them mentioned. How do you go about that, achieving that, 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 that quality aspirations and consistency? Oh. So from, from a, an operating model perspective, we, you know, the program runs for so long, um, you know, 20 plus years, that we have scaled to evolve a number of times over the duration of the program. We've already started to see iterations of that evolution of on phase one, as we move from London to Birmingham, of um, an integrated project team approach. <clears throat> and that allows us to collaborate and work together with our tier one contractors on key decisions and um, focus of key deliverables to make sure that we are not just slope your shoulder client, putting all the risk down to the supply chain and expecting them to deliver against those requirements. We are actually working together to, to, to achieve that common goal. Um, so that, that's the approach that we've adopted for, for phase one. 
um, as we move to the later phases of the program, that model will probably shift. Um, you know, the nature of our contracting will probably shift and we'll learn the lessons from the very earlier stages and make sure that we are continuing to evolve that process. So, you know, number one, I think evolution um, is, is, is key. Um, two, it's the, the integrated approach and collaboration that allows us to work almost seamlessly together, client and contractor. Um, but also, you know, let's not forget the people that are actually delivering the work, the tier two below supply chain. We need to ensure that we have that consistent approach from the client to the tier one all the way through our supply chain. Um, so we we engage a lot with um, with with the different tiers. We have touch point days. Um, you know, the strategies and policies are absolutely critical in making sure that we have that common language. If I focus on it just in, from a, an innovation perspective, that's why we have supported the, the BSI Kite Mark for innovation, because that again, that allows us to give that common language from big, large organizations, our tier one contractors, all the way down to micro innovative SMEs that are delivering the innovation of the program. You know, that's a common language that all of those organizations can work to and deliver upon. Um, and it gives us confidence that if people are working to those standards and you know, kite marks and certifications, that um, it isn't just what's written down on a tender, it's actually they are living and breathing and can evidence that they are working and delivering those processes to meet our expectations as a client. So um, lots of different answers in there, Will, but um, hopefully some value yeah. somewhere. No, no, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm taking three key important points here from this, uh, Rob. That you know, the evolution, you know, the continual improvement is absolutely important. That you know, how we started in phase one and then improving it, you know, and then having that integrated delivery approach, you know, working together with your delivery partners. You know, it's important not just having the top down, like here is my requirement, go and deliver kind of thing. You know, it's working with that. So that really really encouraging to hear and how you're leading that approach and in in the point that you made i couldn't agree more with that you know robin that that common language and it comes across quite sort of loud and clear from all of you as well you know that having that common point you know the reference information you know the right people right time you know with right technologies that that common sort of framework helps and it's great to hear that you as largest you know sort of uh, the infra client you know how you see having that common language in this case in innovation you had that iso 56002 and you know the rest of it you know the kite mark that we uh, you know developed uh, you know and and we we went on the journey together we are seeing similar sort of now you know state in terms of bs 99001 where we have that common language every you know it's integrating all the systems so great great to hear thank you um um, uh, Adrian, do you, I know you mentioned, you know, the 44 times interested parties in, in the new framework now, and what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, working across this large supply chain and, you know, wider interested parties, uh, how do you see, you know, going forward, you know, that, 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 that cascading those sort of aspirations down to supply chain projects? and achieving that consistency in quality. I've got to be careful what I say as a tier one contractor working on Rob's project. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I'm, you know, I'm a big believer in the phrase that you know, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And, and we've always got to make sure that we've got our, our own house in order before we engage our supply chain. So I'm, I'm not a fan of dictating the supply chain just because of you know, external scheme, for example, tells you to do so. You know, if you're not doing it yourself first, and it, and it has to start at the top. You know, you've got to make sure your leadership team are talking about quality. You know, it's commonplace that, that safety drives the start of most board meetings, as it as it should. But you also need to give quality a voice, and and it may be that you need to table the cost of quality, that that because that always draws a discussion. You put a financial sum to errors. But achieving that consistency and quality is challenging. And, and you know, we aim to genuinely work in a collaborative manner with our supply chain, you know, from the outset, you know, setting our requirements, but also ensure that we're sufficiently engaged in delivering the quality outcomes. And when you've got such a diverse supply chain, you know, there are multiple challenges. And subcontractors can or contractors in general obviously vary in size. You know, big often just means more complicated than beautiful. Uh, and it, it mean it might be assumed that 
smaller contractors lack the ability to maintain effective quality systems to achieve consistently good quality. But that, that's not true. Everything's got to be in context. But there is a risk on, on more complex projects that tier one contractors you know, are not sufficiently eyes on when subcontracting packages are work. And that's when it comes back to these kind of world-class basics around, you know, making sure that inspection and testing is a critical element and making sure you're suitably engaged, particularly when employing specialist subcontractors. And again, without going back to, you know, back over this interest of parties too much with 99, but for me, that was one of the biggest observations around the new standard. And it just gave us an opportunity to refresh how our systems were taken into account the requirements of all of our interested parties uh, and i guess i'll let you know how successful that is after stage two thank you adrian uh, i wish we had uh, a <clears throat> longer time you know more, more time i know we are running out of time ian is on the screen now so that's a clue for us visual so thank you everyone adrian rob and stefan for joining with us and sharing this uh, invaluable insights with the audience thank you so much for being on the panel um over to you, Ian. Yeah, I feel, I feel like this sort of spectre that appears at the end of a session to say, "Oh, you must be, you must be running out of time." Ian's face has appeared. That's terrible, isn't it? But I, I agree with you, Round. I, I think it's it's times like this and over forty minutes of conversation that you've had on this topic that it does make me feel we we need to make sure that we shine a light on organisations such as Morgan Sindel, Volkers, HS2. Um, helping us to develop standards and, and the, the good practice or the best practice that you guys have in your brains that's not only helping us to do standards development but then you know gain feedback when we publish something and 99001 is a good example of something that never existed before UK is a market leader when it comes to a, a built environment or construction specific quality management system standard and that will evolve and it's on the feedback that you guys are giving us as a national standards body for the uk that will continue to develop this and continue to help right through the supply chain so thank you so much um unfortunately we do have to draw a close there and say we're going to have around seven minutes of a break until about half past 11 and then we will come back with the next session so thank you very much and see you shortly
Okay. Hi, everybody. We're back again. And the second half of this morning's quality and value session of the Global Built Environment Conference is Ian Nicholson, Value Delivery Lead, Construction Innovation Hub, and Senior Sustainability Leader at Stantec. Hello, Ian. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Hello. We're going to talk about BS Flex 390, driving better outcomes through value-based decision making. And I was just before um, before you were going to get into your your presentation, Ian. I was going to introduce you, and I I looked at your bio, and your bio is incredible. I think I'd need about ten minutes to read everything that you've done. So about four paragraphs of background on Ian. I'm going to I won't read it all, but I'm going to introduce him now and, and pick out a bit of the key points of Ian's bio. So. Currently Senior Sustainability Leader at Stantec, as a conduit to the Construction Innovation Hub, Value Delivery Lead, responsible for leading the team that developed the Value Toolkit, an innovative approach to defining and implementing values-based decision-making into the infrastructure products and programs, and also sponsor for the development of Paz Flex 390. His role is currently focused on transitioning the toolkit to a legacy and sponsor and operator. Originally trained as a civil engineer, worked in the construction industry for over 35 years. Ian in the 90s moved to Anglian Water, where he focused on business improvement activities. Since leaving Anglian Water, Ian has gathered extensive experience in environmental and sustainability issues. And Ian, you also sit on numerous BSI technical committees, I believe, too. So that's a, a whistle-stop background to Ian Nicholson. But hopefully, um, Ian, you can give us some background in, in info on Flex 390. So over to you and thank you. Uh, thanks Ian. Yeah, uh, good morning everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I, I, I haven't been involved in numerous uh, um, BSI committees. I've, I was involved um, until a couple of years ago in um, uh, B558, which is the the standard that looks after all the life cycle, the committee that looks after all the life cycle assessment um, standards in the in the construction industry, so EPDs and and then the the, the sort of asset level standards as well. Um, right, so I'm going to give an introduction to um, BS Flex 390, and as um, as sort of Ian alluded to in in his intro to me there, that's that Flex 390 is one of the outputs that has come from um, the um, the the Value Toolkit um, development project, um, part of the Construction Innovation Hub. So what I'm going to do today, I'm, I'm going to give some background to the Value Toolkit and and, and how that project, that that R and D project, um, has has come about, and then I'll I'll move on into um, an, an overview of the Flex standard itself, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's next, where 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 we're sort of heading next, and what you can do today to sort of start to get up to speed with what it's all about. So if I just go through some background, first of all, for those of you that haven't heard of the Construction Innovation Hub, um, it's, um, it's, it, it formally, well, it's, its first phase of R&D funding came to an end in September this year. Um, and it had been funded from UKRI's Transforming Construction Challenge Fund, which came out of the construction sector deal. Uh, a few years ago uh, and its focus was really around that, that sort of transforming the performance and productivity challenges that the industry faced um, so it's got two primary outputs from all the R&D that's been going on and then a number of sort of well, we're going to say secondary areas. Sec secondary demeans them a little bit, but there, there's two sort of primary high-level outputs that have come from it. One is the value toolkit and the other is um, what we call the platform program um, which is really looking to advance the design for manufacture and assembly type um, area in terms of how we bring man more manufacturing based processes into into construction and then allied to that um, other, there's been numerous other areas of work around digitization um, and, and sort of QA and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, so those are the two primary outputs. I'm obviously going to talk today about the, the, the value toolkit. And, um, and Flex 390. So the toolkit's origins go back to the summer of 2018. And um, th there was a, a report from the Construction Leadership Council in the summer of 2018 called Procuring for Value. And that sort of um, 
um, made two very strong recommendations that there was a need for an industry wide definition of value and the need to um, take more than capital cost into account in project decision making and in particularly through through procurement. Um, and the government in their industrial strategy committee to embedding this procure for value approach into public procurement and building the capability to do that. Um, might sound really simple, some simple words on the page there, but the challenge of, of moving to this idea of, of, of value, decision making around value, and uh, which essentially is all about you know, making decisions around outcomes, which lots of people have been talking about throughout the morning. Um, it's actually really complex uh, because outcomes come from many different areas and particularly in the public sector, you know, there's, there's there's a whole host of sort of stakeholder policy relationships that have to be thought about increasingly in the private sector as well. The increase in the ESG environmental social governance agenda with investors um, is causing the private sector to really think through some of these challenges as well. So it's increasing there as well. And of course, the other thing that we have to think about is is, is market capacity, um, you know, the industry's ability to deliver on some of these new outcome based um, sort, of, sort of approaches. So it's a really complex decision making environment. So the value toolkit was born to really sort of help navigate through there and, and give a toolkit and an approach for for industry to be able to to, to implement that. So we sort of took two fundamental research challenges from that um, from that report one was to develop an industry-wide definition of value um, to help clients understand what value actually means beyond beyond capital cost and the second one was to produce a universally applicable methodology for use um, in procurement and that was has has been really really challenging i have to say um, so to move through the first one quite quickly, we developed a, a, what we called a value definition framework using a capitals approach. Um, some of you may be familiar with, with the, the concept of capitals approach, um, sort of promoted by an organization called the Capitals Coalition, um, which is an, in, uh, an, an international sort of membership based organization that, that sort of lobbies and, and, and does R&D and, and develops approaches and training for, for um, this sort of broader capital valuation approach. So, so we created a framework around those four capitals and that consisted of um, 17 value categories that needed to be considered um, in terms of value-based decision-making within the built environment. So natural capital, it's, it's pro probably everything that you would expect um, to see in, in natural capital in, in, in other areas of environmental work, so air, water, land. Uh, biodiversity, climate and resource use. Um, human capital uh, covers sort of employment, health, skills and knowledge and experience. So they're, they're the things that, that that benefit us as individuals, the values for, for us as, as, um, as individual citizens. Um, social capital looks at involvement and influence, influence and involvement, sorry, equality and diversity, networks and connections. So that's all about um, humans as groups, if you like, societies, communities. Um, so that 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 sort of brings together those sort of more collective-based, um, sort of human-based issues. And then produced capital is where um, you see the, the the sort of more traditional economic um, angles and, and 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 sort of elements. So we talk about life cycle cost. One of the things about demonstrating value is that you really need to think about whole life costing rather than just capital cost. Um, so we are trying to promote a, a, a sort of a move to, to that life cycle costing. Production is is where you would sort of see um, the more traditional sort of quality elements of um, and, and efficiency elements of, of, of um, project delivery. Return on investment and, and and, and that's that's an interesting one for the public sector because um, many public sector agencies aren't about making a profit. So that return on investment is slightly different, but it's about getting the getting the return, the greatest return um, in terms of use and value of that asset um, from, from from the investment they've put in. And then uh, quite importantly, resilience and security um, aspects come into there as well. 
Um, so so that's, that, that value definition framework is there to help clients understand what value means to them. Um, the original output was sort of said, well, you know, create a, create a, a definition of value for the construction industry. Well, you could have gone and tried to create a, a, an Oxford English dictionary type definition. But in, but in reality, value is a, is a very subjective thing and means different things to different people, um, particularly clients, you know, working in different sectors, they will have different different um, priorities and things across that that framework so creating that framework just gives the ability to really hone down what value means for, for a particular context so, so so that's the value definition framework so that's um, um, research challenge number one ticked um, I want to say that was relatively straightforward but um, it, it took some time to, to achieve um, and involved um, 100 200 different um different people within the within the, the the industry helping us to develop that and come to a consensus so then moving on to the process of of embedding value decision making into procurement um we've um there, there's this sort of a three-step process logic that, that we went through um in terms of developing that so number one is what does value mean to me and my stakeholders in the context of the project or program value definition framework is an input into that but then we, we take them through people through a process of how they sort of um, develop that in, into the definition for their particular project or program um, number two is then how am i going to measure whether something meets my value definition and there's some real sort of challenges in there we've spent a lot of time around the the, the measurement of impact um, that comes from from defining that but then, and, and that's encoded into a value definition and measurement stream of, of the value toolkit. So that's the sort of core, if you like, methodology um, for it. But then there's a third process logic that is equally important if you want to get greatest assurance that you are going to deliver the value definition that you've identified. And that is, how do you need to tailor your approach to the project? To delivering the project working with the market to maximize the chances of that value being delivered so that's all about um, commercial aspects procurement how you set up your your commercial strategy and package things up for delivery how you incentivize the market to deliver um, and also risk how you manage the risks of not achieving your value outcomes that links closely to some of the things um, will was saying this morning about you no know, risk and things is that you know you can't just throw money to the supply chain as a risk pot um, against to mitigate uh, non-achievement of value outcomes um, you need to um, it, the client needs to think differently about how they mitigate the risks of not achieving a value outcome it's not just about money so within that there's a there's a, a client approach stream that provides throughout the process provides additional guidance and ideas and pointers of things that clients really ought to be considering if they uh, want to maximize the chances of delivering the value that they've designed and then there's a third um, I'm, I'm not going to call it a stream it's more of an overlay and an alignment um, so after some piloting work that we did on the toolkit um, we did some work with um, the tre um, treasury's green book team to try and help align the toolkit to the green book sort of business case um, process um, and so we've 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 got a, an, an overlay that, that helps people understand where the value toolkit fits into that process as well so what was really interesting um, is that whilst the the policy starting point for this was procuring for value, so about embedding value into procurement, actually there was a realization from the team um, really early on that actually the decision making needs to go much further, much earlier than that. So if you want to define the value, what value we need to deliver, you need to think about well, what's the need we're trying to solve? What's the case for change? Um, so actually the value toolkit is, 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 a, is a, a methodology that helps you through decision making right from that very earliest stage all the way through sort of optioneering design through the procurement stage into, into delivery and also through operations in terms of considering and, and being able to measure the impact and benefits realization. 
so so it's not just about procurement yes procurement is one of the biggest decisions that that, that this toolkit can help you with but actually it really needs to help you um, from that very earliest stage um, because if you embed it that early then you really do increase the chances and maximize the the, the chances of value being delivered because you're embedding the value outputs all the way through the life cycle of your project decision making so <clears throat> journey to date um, there was a lot of rapid sort of technical development work sort of april 20 through to april 21 so basically through the early days of um of, of lockdown um from april to december last year we we were out in a pilot phase and gathering feedback from um around 140 industry um organizations that were that were testing this for us we put them through a bit of training and, and tested the concept version of the toolkit then we went into first half of this year we then went into a review and refine phase um to to sort of um re really sort of tighten down the process improve it on the basis of the feedback that we got um and part of that also involved developing um the flex standard that, and that's part of the, the the sort of legacy piece as well um and I'll, so I'll, I'll come back to the rationale for the for the flex um a little bit later um, but the first version of the flex 390 was published in june the second version is due out imminently um in the next probably couple of weeks or so i would think um so that's the plan we're just sort of finalizing the the, the feedback that we've had and then july to september this year um we've focused on developing the training on that reviewed and refined toolkit um, so we're developing a training suite developed that and we piloted it with with a few um, industry people through september and now everything that we've developed is essentially mothballed um, while we find um, a legacy home to transfer those assets to because one of the key things the strategy board wanted was that the value toolkit was going to have a, a sustainable legacy somebody that was going to champion it and 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 move it forward for the medium to long term um obviously the the hub it's continuing its funding it's it's secured some more funding from ukri but it's not an organization that's going to um probably exist for forever and a day so it's not an organization that can run run the toolkit for for that sort of longer term so if we move on into the um so the let the, the flex standard itself um and give it a bit of background why um why, why a flex standard well it's a mechanism of translating the what that's come out of all sorts of different um sort of policy documents so during the life of the project um the value toolkit has been embedded into government policy including the the transfer transforming infrastructure performance report from the ipa um, Treasury Green Book will include some some commentary around the value toolkit. Um, they're not embedding it as, as as the method of delivering it. That's not the way Treasury operate, uh, but they are sort of endorsing the value toolkit within Green Book. And it's also um, mentioned quite uh, quite widely through the construction playbook as well. So it's there embedded in 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 public policy so what we needed to do was make sure that there, we could translate those policy requirements into into a what so so we've sort of reverse engineered from the value toolkit into a set of principles that encompass um, value-based decision making and, and if you like a specification for that which is what the flex standard is doing and then the value toolkit is a means of implementing that that flex standard um, and, and that and that specification um, so what I'm just going to do is, is run through the core substantive clauses, if you like, of, of, of the standard. So it's got the normal sort of boilerplating scope um, definitions and, 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 and the like um, at either end of the standard. But the core sort of material substance comes um, in, in a, number of, uh, a number of clauses. So it takes you through... A process of identifying your strategic objectives so that are, those are what are the high level drivers and objectives that are really critical for delivery and achievement in, in a particular project so you go through the, the, a process of doing that there's multiple ways of doing that um, sometimes it's via the green book process so, so that will give you an overlay as to what those drivers and objectives are if you're not working via a green book process 
um, then then you can do your own mapping of policy drivers from from almost the, the, the sort of bottom up using corporate policy and strategy and, and local regional sort of policy where your where your project sits. You map all of those onto the value definition framework and do a, a pairwise prioritization to understand relative importance. What you then do is move into a, a, a phase of developing outcome drivers. Now, what they are, they are almost smart objectives, if you like. Um, so they are very specific, actionable statements that a design and delivery team can can demonstrate achievement against, um, and and there and then by by definition achieve um, help achieve strategic objectives the strategic objectives very often are quite generic statements and and as a as a t as a project team you don't say well how the hell am i meant to uh, in, in, improve educational attainment if i'm building a school and what is it that, that that i need to do as a design team to, to help the client achieve that so the the development of outcome drivers just translate those really sort of high level, quite strategic, generic statements into something very specific and actionable and measurable um, for in in the project context. You then do a second level of prioritization, which is a, a rating of influence. So if you achieve this outcome driver, what is the degree of influence of onto the um, strategic objective that? in terms of achieving that objective that the outcome driver will have. So that gives you a, a, a more detailed level of prioritization of those outcome drivers. You then move into the development of what we've called value scorecards. Um, and this is where I think the, the real difference really starts to, 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 to sort of come. Um, so for, for each outcome driver, you will establish a measure of success. And that's working on the principle of starting with the end in mind. So how will I know that I have successfully achieved each of these outcome drivers? So you set a metric that will that will demonstrate to you that that, that has been achieved. You then use those as the basis for value scorecards. Now, the key thing here is that there isn't a single scorecard for the whole project. You develop decision specific scorecards. So you might create one for optioneering to help you in the optioneering in the feasibility stage to, to, to identify from your shortlist of options um, the appropriate one to take through as your take forward as your preferred solution. Um, you can use a scorecard again in the tendering process, which we'll, we'll come on to. So, 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 so there, there's a number of things that you have to do to create a scorecard. First of all, you look at each of the outcome drivers and say, can this driver actually be influenced in th at this particular point in the project? Um, and if it can't be, then you actually remove it from um, from your from your scorecard. You then confirm the performance metrics. So you you look at the measures of success and say, can that actually be measured at this point in the project? And if it can't, then you identify a proxy measure um to to um to, to use as a, as, as a substitute um in that in, in in that particular point in the project and then you set a minimum target and maximum performance range that you want to see for that particular outcome you then collect all of those or all of that data and then use the scorecard to either evaluate different options optimize a, 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 an option so you can use it in design review evaluate tenders and then once you're into delivery and um and, and, and operational phases, you can use a scorecard to validate the performance um, of those scorecards. Um, so that's the overarching process and the, and the flex standard takes you through a, a process of, of the things you need to be considering in that approach. Clause eight um, is about the, the, the value based decision making phases. So this sort of outlines how you use the process and how it evolves through through the different phases um, of, of the toolkit. Now, I should stress these these phases, they started as project phases and we realized, well, actually, the nature of value based decision making, it's not just about delivering and building a capital project. It could be about something very different. The solution might not be to construct anything in the traditional sense. You know, it could be that the need is to is to um, to, to make the, the building more comfortable um, to, to live or work in. So the solution, the case for change might be to actually go and, and, and reconfigure the building management system. So it might actually be a software a software based project. 
Um, so, so the nature of all that just means that we, we, we move to a very generic set of phases that can overlay onto traditional overlays like the Reba, the Reba phases or you know other 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 sort of phases of projects that, that are out there. But we've tried to make it really generic so that it can work with any type of intervention. And then we talk about the roles and responsibilities that are key. Um, so the value toolkit by definition is a facilitated process. There are tools, there's spreadsheets and there's a web app that, that can help the facilitator, but, but at its core, it's a facilitated process. It needs somebody to guide the client and the team through this. So the facilitator is a key role. Um, and, then, and then we talk in generic terms about strategic team, concept team, design team. So the different groups of people that the client needs around them at particular points through the through the development of a project. And then we talk a little bit about risks and opportunities. We don't define a risk man management approach. We just point to ISO 31000. What we're highlighting in this standard is the need to adapt your risk management approach to make sure it's picking up this wider consideration of value of not achieving value outcomes um, so then very quickly what's next um, so December is when we're looking to, um, to, 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 to to publish version two of the flex and as I said earlier me and my colleagues are now working on on transferring the value toolkit into a legacy home for a, to give it a sustainable operating model going forward. I can't say too much about that uh, because we are under under NDA um, talking to some organizations about how we take this forward. What I will say is that, um, that our strategy board were very, very clear that they didn't want it to go to a commercial home of somebody just making money out of operating this. Um, so it, it's it's going into, it, it will be going to, to a home where it will be operated for the benefit of industry. That doesn't mean to say it'll be free because there will be costs that that need to be covered. But it's um, so so that there will be some fees attached to using it. But it will it um, it's it, it's it's going into a structure that will that, that isn't about making profit. So where that goes, who knows? Um, and developing the flex was actually um, part of the the, the the sort of almost the fail safe. So if all of that fails. Um, and and, the, and we, we don't identify or successfully transfer this to a legacy home in the, in the time we have available, um, then, then we need to get it out there, it, the, the, the value toolkit learning out there in a way that industry can still use and continue to develop. So putting it into a, uh, into a flex standard with BSI seemed to be the most appropriate way to, to have a fail safe to make sure that if all the commercial type decisions fail um, on legacy, then we, then we, we, we still, had, still had a solution. Um, so what can you do in the in the interim period? I mean, if if you haven't already, I would encourage you to go and have a look at the construction playbook um, and the the tip roadmap to 2030 from the IPA because they're two very key documents in just sort of giving big picture about how we need to change as an industry. Um, download and start using Flex 390. It is a free standard. Um, that's part of the the sponsorship process that uh, of, of developing a Flex. Um, so so it will be a free. It is a freely available standard. Try and embed it into early stage decision making in your projects and programs. In, start engaging with clients and get them to start it, encouraging them to 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 establish and define their perspective of value. Um, and then go if you go to the link that's at the bottom of this page, you can go and find out a bit more about the value toolkit. There are some some elements that are out there in the public domain. So there's a more detailed overview guide um, that talks through in more detail than I've had the time to do here about how it works. There is also um, some high level sort of e-learning modules that are available as awareness modules that are, we've partnered with the Supply Chain Sustainability School to, to host. Again, that, that hyperlink that you've got there to that resource library um, gives you a link into there and if you want to keep keep up to date with what we're doing then subscribe to the newsletter which again you can do on that website so uh, i think that's uh, i think that's my last slide so yes i think just about on time ian sorry about that i mean i was so engrossed in your in your presentation there drinking my tea i forgot i wasn't a panelist i was chairing so i quickly turned the camera on <laughs> <laughs> Terrible mistake. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Really good. 
Um, yeah, and some points um, just to raise while you were talking there. So um, Jane Simpson, um, hi Jane, thanks for joining us, um, who, who put some questions and comments into the chat. Again, you talked about the REVA plan of works. Jane says that it covers accessibility, says you must start at the earliest stage, could not agree more. So clearly that resonates with people that are listening to what you've said. And, and Jane, I know a few other questions that we'll try and weave into the, the, the panel session later. So thank you for those too. But yeah, I mean, the flex, the flex is an interesting um, model for standardization, isn't it, Ian? In the, it, it came about during the pandemic when there was a need to try and speed up the standards development process for what can be European and international standards years and for British standards 12 months, 18 months <clears throat> and even for a publicly available specification maybe nine months. So when you need something that's really reacting to a, a, a market need the Flex product has been really good in that sort of iterative way of developing but keeping that consensus based model doesn't it. So you found that I guess that's been really helpful for the for the value toolkit. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a way of getting things out out quickly. And so, so I think for R&D projects, it's a really good way of engaging, engaging the market, engaging industry, because you yeah. don't have to have everything fully defined and a full consensus in terms of detail um, no. be, before you first go out there. And I think that the key difference just around those timelines that makes it quicker is that it, it goes out for use and consultation at the same time yeah um so so people can be actively downloading it and using it and 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 have a comments port comments portal to to put put comments back in again so so that that is a real benefit and that really works well in in as i say in the r d world um so yeah. so yes yeah. i i found, have, having worked with standards for many years it's frustrating how long um it takes to get something out um, with you we use the word innovation haven't we throughout this morning and i think that's sometimes not just innovation in terms of an industry or a sector but it's also innovation in terms of standards development and i think you yeah, benefit. yeah yeah like i say it was born out of sort of face coverings and face masks during the pandemic you couldn't have you couldn't really have waited two years to have had standardization <laughs> those so it's actually a, a, again using the word legacy it's something i think that the industry is beginning to benefit from in, in those places where it needs it so thank you very much. We, we're, we're just past time, but we'll bring you back in when we get to the panel session, Ian, and I'm sure, sure you'll yeah, be able yeah. to give us a little bit more insight when we get to the questions. Yeah, so thank worries. you so much. All right. No worries. Thank you. So we have arrived at the final presentation for quality and value. And there is Cliff. Hello, Cliff. Our, our, our Geary judge is coming in with his scores um, to, to give it a sort of Eurovision type um, feel to it, Cliff. I hope you're OK. So we're going to talk about avoiding error and how it benefits productivity, safety, sustainability and quality, which I couldn't think of a better title for a session, Cliff, if I, uh, if I tried. So I'm just going to give you a very quick intro about Cliff before he goes into his presentation. So Cliff is executive director of Geary, the Get It Right Initiative. Fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers, more than 40 years experience in the construction industry, 38 working with contractor Sir Robert Mount McAlpine, subsequently as a consultant offering specialist engineering and tech support, project and design management, strategic quality leadership, director of the Get By Initiative since its formation, involved in the development of the guide to improving value by reducing design error and a, and a number of research reports on the use of technology in the construction industry all of which are available to download from the Geary website. We should say that, shouldn't we? Cliff leads an agile Geary de delivery team covering administration, communications, finance and research. He's a very busy man. We appreciate his time. Without further ado, over to you, Cliff. OK, um, can everybody hear me? Good. And uh, thank you, Ian, for that uh, introduction. I'm sure somebody wrote that for you. <laughs> Uh, it's great to be here and uh, hopefully I can uh, discuss with you some of the uh, issues that arise out of the discussions earlier today. Um, there have been a lot of discussion over the years and views expressed throughout the construction industry about, um, the slide's not quite working as they should, um, Okay, so um, 
it's important that we understand that the ideas of Giri, which is to get things right, is important. And whether there's any legislation or uh, things like this, it's, it's important to us all that we do get things right. And uh, what we're looking at today is the, the why, the what and the how of Giri. So firstly, the why. The Giri was set up back in 2015 on the basis of a discussion amongst some uh, high up people in, shall we say, the best practice people in the uh, Institute of Civil Engineers, looking at productivity and how it's impacted by waste through error. And they felt that this was a really a big issue for the industry. And, and of course it, it is and, has, and remains so. So uh, how much uh, money was uh, being spent and what was the cost of error? So a study was uh, carried out with some input from uh, financial input to support the research from the industry. And this was the uh, results of that research. Direct cost of error, 5% of uh, turnover. This is the error we see. Um, this is the error that's recorded and we know about and uh, is, is corrected uh, on the spot, if you like. Then there was 7% was indirect cost. This is the cost associated with the impacts on others in, in involved in the same process at the same time uh, and affecting their resources and, uh, and timescales. And then 6% unrecorded process waste. These are errors which are, are identified, that they, they occur, but they're not necessarily recorded. So um, we, we don't have any great record of them. And then there's latent defects, which is uh, unfortunately a, a habit in the industry of having to go back and sort things out after, after handover. So this is a 21% uh, wasted spend on error. Now, if we look at that in the context of an iceberg, just to give you some imagery, the 5% is the bit on the top and the, the other 16% uh, is, is below the surface we, we, where, we, where we, we don't see it. And if you think about the construction industry having a turnover of, what, 100 billion a year, then we're talking about 22 billion pounds of waste and frankly this is uh, this is uh, able to be um, spent on uh, the uh, another hs2 for example so um i just want to look at uh productivity this is where we came from in, in Giri, but it's important to see the link between productivity and quality. So a definition of productivity is uh, the a relationship between if effectiveness and efficiency. Quite often people talk about uh, productivity being an output over input figure, but if you are efficient at just producing the what's on the drawing or what's in the specification, but with no respect for doing it right, then you're not effective. So we need effectiveness, which is where the quality comes in, as well as the efficiency. And construction productivity has been a problem for the industry. Uh, if you look at the red line here on, on the left, that's the construction productivity line, well below many other sectors. And uh, if you look at the right hand side, the productive time, generally speaking, 55%. And if we're losing another 20% on that, on error, here you can see the, the big impact it's having. Construction businesses on average are uh, making what, two or 3% per annum. And if, if they're wasting 20%, it's an order of magnitude difference and we definitely need to do better. These are the areas the study showed where cost was of the greatest. And uh, you can see the concrete works there. Well, we do pour a lot of concrete in construction, but there are many other 
areas where we we are wasting money the, the, interestingly the root causes of error were more at the early stages of projects and i don't think uh, we should ignore the in, impact of the design uh, that six out of the top 10 items relate to design and of course excessive commercial pressures uh, ineffective communication and an element in terms of supervisory skills so the root causes the core culture planning design and supervision let's just have a little think about culture i don't know if any of you have read this book by matthew sighead but uh, it's it makes interesting reading there was a uh, an, an example where uh, about culture concerning the uh, hospital where uh, a lady came in for a tr for treatment and it was found that uh, she died during a fairly simple process and the nurse uh, was trying to advise a surgeon on what she thought should be done but the surgeon ignored her and this was a cultural impact and this need we have in the construction industry now is that the we need to listen to other people uh, to to our operatives and so forth and of course there's the human tragedy associated with defects and we come to these through our um we come to these through our Building Safety Act uh, issues. I'm, I'm sorry, I've completely lost the plot here. The Building Safety Act came into being following this disaster. And uh, Dame Judith, Judith Hackett's report was scathing about the attitudes and culture of those involved in the construction industry. The, the new Building Safety Act is based on those conclusions and we contributed as Geary to the uh, development of the Act. So let's take a quick look at some of the extracts from the Dame Judith's report. Cultural and behavioural change is referred to directly and this extract here refers to this and in particular the corrosive effects of doing things as cheaply as possible lowest cost procurement is the culture we need to address and i think that our earlier discussion today on the value toolkit is particularly relevant in this area but the new legislation will move the industry towards statutory compliance with quality requirements geary is provisioned position to provide support in this transition Other aspects of the report dealt with quality and competence and uh, mentioned change control, quality assurance, and came to the conclusion that the efforts that we're uh, looking to make to improve the industry are all linked together. We can see the impact of cultural change in the industry when we look at safety. Back in 2003, the, the very poor safety record in the industry was challenged by John Prescott, who was then Deputy Prime Minister. And this was backed up by a focus on compliance with, with the terms of health and safety legislation. Uh, there was a minimum to comply attitude to start with, but this was uh, replaced by uh, a cultural change as, as the improvements plateaued. And I think this cultural change is exactly what we need in uh, quality as well. And the draft safety, uh, uh, act, uh, sorry, the Building Safety Act is going to help us with that. So let's look at Geary's role in the improvement process. Our strategic aim is to uh, improve construction productivity but also quality and uh, 
reducing cost and waste by eliminating error. There are a number of benefits that arise from an error-free approach. We've talked about the productivity, but there's also the safety, sustainability, quality, predictability, and reputational aspects. It's been about five years or more now since uh, Giri set out these objectives. We've had Grenfell, Brexit and COVID and many climate issues, and they're all uh, added to external pressures on the construction sector and bringing new challenges to business, seeking to get things right first time. So our aims and objectives, creating a culture and working environment to get things right from the start, changing attitudes and leadership to reduce error, engaging all stakeholders, sharing knowledge about error reduction processes and systems, and improving skills. And this involves setting up some strategic priority themes, delivering a strategic awareness campaign, developing a skills program, developing improvements to processes, systems and technology to remove error and providing opportunities to share experience and network. So how are we going about this? Well, firstly, we set up a, a Geary in back in 2017 as a limited not-for-profit organisation. And uh, more recently, we established our strategic leadership group who um, are set up to provide us with uh, direction uh, in um, in carrying out our uh, objectives. Uh, these are the current members of the strategic leadership group and as you can see they are some ma major players in the industry who um, help us to keep on, on message. The, the current Geary membership comprises over 90 companies uh, right across the industry, uh, government to uh, clients, consultants and lawyers and insurance brokers. And this is just a, a view of some of the uh, current members, many of whom you will recognise. So let's have a quick look at Geary. We're set up to provide some thought leadership through our training arm, through the campaigns we run, through our forums, webinars. And then we also look at knowledge sharing through our website. We've got many research uh, papers that have been done and uh, are easily accessible. We're very active in social media and we provide plenty of networking opportunities. So let's just look at these benefits. I've talked already about productivity. On the safety side, it's worth mentioning here that a study was done in Australia, and it, there's no reason to believe it's significantly different here, that 37% of accidents occur during rework. And so getting things right is going to help on the safety front. Clearly, there's a sustainability benefit because if we're not wasting materials and resources, we're definitely going to be improving our carbon footprint. I think the quality benefits are manifest. And in terms of the predictability, if we're not wasting time and money, if, if we're improving productivity, then our outputs in terms of time and quality and cost are much more predictable and this is going to give us all a better reputation. We have a major training uh, opportunity. We obtained funding from the CITB uh, back in 2018 and developed three uh, accredited courses. We've now got further uh, funding and we are pushing out our train the trainer courses. So looking at the leadership course, 
We explore why reducing error is important and look at behaviours. Our courses are predominantly about behaviours and uh, the culture change that's needed. And leadership is clearly a, has a big role in this. We also have an interface management course. This is a fairly simple uh, construction detail, but as you can see, there are interfaces or many interfaces that need managers. The space interface of actually in the on the project itself and time getting people there in the right sequence and and people because they need to have the right skills and abilities to do what's necessary and that's just a fairly straightforward detail and you can multiply that up many times to what we have to, have to face in construction and our interface management course addresses this and then we have a supervisors and managers course i talked earlier about this need for a culture where we're prepared to listen to people when they've got a point to make unfortunately in the industry we tend to ha have a lot of unhelpful interventions what we're trying to do and what our course does is to move from unhelpful to helpful interventions and when we have those interventions there may be some disagreement because we shouldn't just be doing things because we're told to so we need to move towards getting helpful disagreement and we need to create a culture and, a, and, a, and an environment for people to feel comfortable to raise concerns to do this you need to think about building things in your brain before you do what you're what you're being asked to do and then push pause if you want to avoid error so this is it drawings have only just been issued and have a lot of detail we're likely to make errors if we start constructing this part before i've been able to build it in my brain we need to press pause to avoid error so this pressing pause to avoid error is all part of the culture that we're looking for as we develop our behaviors during the past year we've done work with the hs2 on developing a strategy for reducing error. And this process has, has developed along those lines. So these uh, expert working groups are set up, which identify the errors within a particular asset area. And then those are prioritized, the root causes are addressed, and then the quantification of inter the opportunity for intervention is carried out and then the interventions uh, take place to uh, achieve betterment and reduce error and this is already at the delivery phase now with uh, HS2 on a number of their assets. We also have campaigns and presentations such as this one and uh, this year we've been talking to the under in International Underwriters Association in the in the insurance sector, the building sector. Uh, we've been talking to students and uh, in, and the ICE, and we've also got uh, forums taking place regularly. A particularly good uh, forum this year, uh, which I thought was very eye eye opening, was the uh, webinar on the Carmont Rail disaster up in Scotland where the uh, activities of various parties involved uh, in, uh, uh, again, another tragedy, gave us uh, insight into better ways to communicate and uh, avoid error. Metrics are, are very important as well. We're working with the Construction Leadership Council to develop a cross-industry metric. I mentioned earlier the uh, link between uh, quality and safety. Well, the quality culture, that the safety culture change was partly contributed to by the accident frequency rate, which was a cross industry measure. And we think that a cross industry error frequency rate is what's required if we're going to uh, help in get that culture right across our industry. We've done quite a lot of research over the years and we are currently involved in updating the original cost of error research. 
this is this has been a challenge because although there is a lot of data around in the industry and uh, we talked about that earlier uh, in the um, panel discussion about the availability of data but getting hold of it and using it effectively is is a challenge for the industry and we're certainly facing that at the moment although things are improving we've uh, we've in 2017, we developed a design guide. This was published in 2018, and uh, last year we had a look at the uh, the take up of it. It, it's ba it was basically a document available to download from the, the website. What we've now done is we've had we've carried out an edit of the of the design guide and it's uh, now available in on its own mini website we launched it last week it has an uh, an accompanying video and it's not a it's not a, a plan of works or anything like that but it, it it's a guide to help anyone involved in the construct in, con in construction right from the start through to uh, handover although there is a uh, an emphasis on the front end investment and of time and that one needs to get things right we do have a type technology group and the themes of that group align with many again many of these discussions earlier this morning about for instance, applying the golden thread principles, but we're also carrying out research into the effectiveness of technology at the workplace, again mentioned earlier today. We have an insurance working group. Insurance is an issue, big issue for the construction industry at the moment. Premiums are going up. Some uh, in, insurers are backing away from construction, but clients are quite often asking for greater uh, levels of insurance protection so we're working with insurers to try and find ways in which we can alleviate some of these challenges we've got a building safety act steering group we're going to launch a campaign shortly because we believe that although there are many in the industry who are familiar, shall we say, with the, the Act, there's still a hell of a lot of people who aren't taking on board the impacts that it's going to have. We collaborate widely and uh, are on the uh, BSI committee which has brought me here today but uh, we're also working with the code of practice on the code of practice for design management and uh, work with construction constructing excellence so that's a resume of where we are with giri at the moment uh, i'm sorry for some of the uh, challenges that i've had with delivery because i've got two screens here which aren't agreeing uh, but I hope you've got the gist of what I was trying to uh, message I was trying to get across. And of course, if there's any anything you want to to raise with me, then please do that in the question time. Thanks very much. So thank you, Cliff. <clears throat> really fascinating and detailed uh, journey through Geary, and, and to some extent the sort of not just the philosophies that you're following, but how they came about. So, yeah, really interesting. And as you say, it resonates with a lot of the presentations we've had already. So <clears throat> we're almost to the minute onto the panel session. So your timing there, Cliff, was impeccable. Um, and I, I think, interestingly, I, I wrote a, a blog for BSI this week around quality in 99001, referenced a lot of those Geary reports that you you mentioned in your resource library and, and it was a sort of approach around if only sort of the concept of if only oh if only i'd have done this before we got to this point then it would and i think by the time you get to if only things are a little too late so i think it is definitely about eliminating error earlier in your in your process so that pause button i think is a really interesting thing 
So thank you so much. Um, we're just going to spend a little bit of time before we close on uh, questions that Cliff mentioned. So if I can ask all of our illustrious panel members there to appear on camera <clears throat> as they all rush to press the button. Who got there first? Winner of the Quality Street is, oh, it looks like it might have been Will. Okay, so <laughs> thank you all for your presentations. Um, really good. And I think we said right at the start of this that actually the whole point of these annual BSI Global Blue Environment Conferences, and we've had four sessions over two days, the last of them being um, on modern methods of construction with, with my colleague Claire Price this afternoon, is to try and give insight to the audience about those challenges, but also potential solutions. And, and, and Cliff touched on questions. We have had a lot of questions before and during the, um, the session. So I'm just going to try and throw a few of them out there. You know, we've, we're running out of time. We might not get through everything. We might not get to all of you, but we'll try and spread some questions around and, and ask each of you something in the next sort of 15 or 20 minutes. So interestingly, there were some questions. If we group these together into some of the, the themes, there were definitely some questions around culture. So we've heard from, from uh, uh, almost all of you about those culture aspects, certainly in Cliff's Geary presentation, culture came up. But Will, I don't know, I mean, this seems a long time ago, Will, when you gave your presentation. I feel like, you know, we've aged a lot in the last two and a half hours, you know, but uh, maybe if we come to you first, because we've had some interesting conversations, haven't we, when we've talked about culture and you had a you had a take on on this that I wonder if you could kick the, kick us off with your thoughts on, you know, how do you think that the culture of the industry can be changed? Well, yeah, certainly I can give it a go <clears throat> because um, when uh, I usually cringe a little bit when I see questions or claims about the culture of the industry um, because, yeah, I might have, you know, sort of pretty down to earth grassroots origins, but there's a lot about culture that I really appreciate in life. Um, and I don't think that's what people mean. <laughs> Culture is a very vague concept. It's not something, the kind of thing that people are complaining about when they complain about the culture of the industry, they're complaining about something that has not consciously been chosen. It's people don't just, I always remember the, the great joke we had about the Egan report, the first sentence, the first thing in the summary was, number one, change the culture of the industry. You know, we just sat around and laughed a bit and said, so what do we do after lunch? You know, culture isn't just a cloak that you can change at will. Um, it's a consequence of a myriad of behaviors and habits. So I might be out on a limb here, but my view is that culture is not a cause. It's an effect. It's a consequence. It's an abstract concept that represents a complex array of customs, conventions and habits. Really, it's an undefined box into which we pop things that we can't actually explain. Um, Maybe I'm influenced by students on this, but you know they like to have vague, undefined boxes into which they can drop things. So, but it's a question. Perhaps it's just an invitation for people to talk about what they whatever they want to talk about. Um, so, I don't think culture in itself is an issue that can be managed, and it's probably more important to focus on something tangible that we can inspire people to do or to avoid doing. So, I'm always interested in what a questioner means by culture. Maybe they mean late payment, lack of rationality. Maybe they mean we need an audit trail for decisions, failures in leadership. You take your pick. Um, so I would prefer to focus on specific actions. What is it that we're doing that's wrong? Don't call it culture. Actually think about what people do. When do they do what they say and say what they do? And when do they not? Um, and start on picking proper tangible things that we can manage and deal with um, like the flex 390 i mean amazing ian congratulations that was a brilliant presentation i really enjoyed it um, that to me focused a lot on what people might mean by culture so that's my answer Thank you, Will. Yes, exactly. It's an interesting place to start, isn't it? That it is often a word that we hear and throughout these, these webinars we've done over the last 12 months, it always comes up. You're absolutely right. But really, you, you want to be able to give something meaningful and tangible in, in return. And perhaps it's ignoring, you know, 
it's, it's quite alien for me working for a, a national standards body where I spend most of my time talking about terminology and terms and definitions. And here we are trying to say, well, what is culture and how can we change it? But Rob, I can imagine something as vast as HS2. And, and I just wanted, just before we come to you on culture, Rob, Jane's question earlier was around sort of um, a part of this with the supply chain and, and how do you push, not she's mentioned standards through the supply chain, but actually maybe there's a cultural shift through the supply chain as well. Is there any thoughts that you could give us from, from your perspective on this one? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, culture is a, a word that I, I, you know, from an innovation perspective, I come across a lot um, uh, and I really um, can relate to what Will was just saying. Um, particularly in an industry where we seem to measure a lot how do you measure culture um where it, it's far easier to measure an outcome um such as cost carbon safety time quality those things are, are far easier to measure and um if i focus for a moment purely on the innovation space because that's where i'm familiar that i can measure the improvement of innovation through productivity through uh cost through carbon and the way we do that is report that very openly um and um just i, I guess on your initial question you said that someone used the word push um you know how do we push standards on and uh, there's, there's ways that you can as a client there's i guess there's ways that you can influence a culture you can use a stick you can use a carrot and you can use something in the middle. Um, we tend to use um, a collaborative approach and we try to incentivize for realizing savings against the baseline, for reducing the carbon expenditure of the, of the project. And if we are having some good news stories come out of that, then we publicize them. We make them available to the general public. We make them available to industry in our learning legacy. Um, so I, I think that's, the sort of incentive that we use to stimulate cultural change um, and if I just try to answer the question on specifically on standards um, you know that that is all around sort of the common goal um, we are contracted by the department for transport um, our tier one supply chain are contracted for us there is a natural flow down of of terms and and uh, you know a common goal that we're all looking to achieve there so um, yeah, I think it's really around incentivization and rewarding good behaviors and good results when they happen and make sure that we're we're sharing that good practice and educating others to, to step up to the plate. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. I completely echo those thoughts. And, and Cliff, I don't know if you want to just expand because culture definitely came up throughout yours. And, and it's not just, I guess, saying cultural change or cultural shift it's also trying to think of you know tangible ways to do that is there anything you could add to your your thoughts on, on that from your presentation yeah i think the uh definition of culture which uh, will was uh, alluding to this is a collection of behaviors of an organization and how the people in that organization organization or industry or whatever behave and it's that behavior point that uh, we need to address how are people behaving you know do people get up in the morning and think oh well i'm going to go to work and do a crap job no they don't the, the behaviors are uh, affected by their environment how uh, other people interact with them what their bosses say what their peers do and what we're trying to do is constantly improve that environment that people are working in so the behaviors change and the culture improves and i agree in terms of measuring the culture change is very difficult i mean in terms of uh, safety which i mentioned i think we could say that the culture in the construction industry in 2000 about safety is considerably different from the culture in the construction industry about safety in 2022 so there has been a cultural change but we didn't push a button and say oh let's have some better culture what we had to do is change behaviors of people over a long period of time so uh yes skiri is about the uh, addressing the behaviors so that we can uh, 
the effect of that will be a, a, a cultural improvement. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm going to acknowledge Arwin's question here, where she's, what efforts are we going to make to make these sessions a bit more diverse? No disrespect to the highly experienced and knowledgeable panel, but how can one group of people comment effectively on culture? I completely agree. And, and this was not, you know, when we talk about diversity at the moment, and that's, you know, an objective for, for every organisation, especially BSI at the moment, uh, I, I completely acknowledge the fact that we might not have a particularly diverse panel right here, but I think that was partly due to circumstance rather than the deliberate. So, yeah, I completely agree with that. And I certainly, I, I would I would probably say that, that all of those people that were involved with the development of 99,001, for example, know that that was an incredibly diverse set of people. I just think perhaps it's, it's fallen a little bit, unfortunately, today that we don't represent that level of diversity. So, yeah, thank you for the question. And, and Adrian, I, I, I think, I mean, I had a set of questions here, but I almost feel a bit like it's sort of, you know, do a bit of that with this, because you mentioned about, you know, your reaction to, to Will's presentation at the outset. Is there is there anything, you know, that, that sort of came up in your mind as, as Will was presenting that sort of leads you to, to have a question for him or, or, or stimulated some, some, some thoughts in terms of what you thought today was all was likely to be about? I'm springing this on you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's an interesting panel challenge, a, a cross-panel question. Um, yeah, I think it was really just, I picked up on something that Will said around, you know, the scale of the management task needs to be acknowledged. And I think, you know, when, when we look at some of the challenges we face as an industry uh, and, and the blockers, there is a huge risk of information overload. You know, modern day construction is immensely complex. Uh, and it places significant pressures on project teams, even when you, you know, digitise information workflows. And, and I think as an industry, we need to understand the capacity of as, as human beings. There is only so much information we can process and only so many things we can do uh, in a given day. And there was also something that, uh, picking up something Rob said, also about data. You know, we are an industry that is great at gathering data. But it doesn't mean to say that data is useful. Uh, and uh, there's there seems to be a bit of excitement about suddenly plowing you know data into big Power BI dashboards, but actually you then find that there isn't an audience reading it. So, you know, it's the, there's a couple of things there for me that are, are, are real challenges for our industry, particularly when considered considering <coughs> everything. But we, we've just got to be really considerate of the fact that there is this management task you know what what we're striving to achieve and how we achieve it we've got to be really careful about that we don't generate ideas concepts and systems in darkened rooms that, that place too much pressure on on the people that are trying to build something in simple terms i don't know if anybody wants to respond to that or will maybe something that you can you can reply to or we can move to another question if that's if that's easy because we've got about 10 minutes to go yeah we can't hear you again will the old headphones challenge again yeah we've got you we've got you that's good can you click now can yeah we can hear you yeah yeah we're right good. Just switched it off and switched it back on again. <laughs> the, the information overload is a serious issue. And um, th as soon as Adrian said that, it's jogged a memory in my mind of the 1960s and 1970s management literature on how, I mean, you know, PowerPoint, the, the curse of our life, which makes us powerless and pointless. Um, that whole idea of business management presentations arose because management needed filtered summary information uh, that, that you know powerpoint wasn't meant for this kind of work it was meant for um staff to report to senior managers so management reports used to be very very small very light on detail and the whole idea that senior management ha had to be across all this information was was kicked into touch rapidly and what we need to do is to develop better techniques for filtering out just the essential points and um, one of the things one of the ideas we're developing in in um, pwi 6082 on project governance is the idea that 
the management of the delivery team needs to be influencing, not hands-on managing, but monitoring the way that outcomes are looking and then suggesting and nudging. You can do that without masses of information, but what you can't do as a, as a senior project director or senior project manager is to get completely embedded in the detail. So it's always been an issue for management, is my point. For 50 years, we've known that senior decision-making needs to be based upon essential points. And um, one of the interesting things about Cliff's presentation was the idea of, of using dashboards and filtering information out so that we just get the essential message. Otherwise, management is going to be incredibly bureaucratic and administrative because the quantity of information is going to be huge. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you for that, Will. And thanks for the, the, the cross-panel questioning there. That was very useful. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Stefan, I'm going to come to you next, uh, just in terms of, of quality in 99001. There was obviously, at uh, these type of webinars and topics, there is always the, the Building Safety Act that comes up. And, and I think it was touched on in your panel session earlier with Raul. But it, is, there, is there a sense that um, the, the, the take up of 99001, do you think it's closely aligned to the Building Safety Act? Is that, is that something that, that, that we're going to see that you can take up with? Um, possibly. Um, to, to answer the question, though, as to whether the two are aligned, um, they were obviously both drafted by different um, organisations, different people involved in them. However, uh, there are similarities in terms of the themes that the two uh, um, are, are covering. Um, 99001 follows all of the, the, the structure of all of the ISO standards. It's exactly the same. Um, so within 99001, it, it covers leadership, uh, it covers the organisation, it talks about um, planning uh, and the resources. And pretty much everywhere within 99001, it's talking either about interested parties or competence. 99001 is littered with stuff around ensuring that you've got the competence right, that the leadership is appointing the right people with the right competence to be able to manage the activities on a construction project around the, the planning of, of, of construction. And for me, achieving quality is all about planning. If we don't plan for quality, we're not going to achieve a, a quality quality output and the building safety act when you look at the building safety act there's there's a number of themes which um the building safety act for me are are trying to get across and it's very very much aligned in terms of all of what we've been di discussing it's about um appointing the right people so the act is talking about appointing um principal contractors principal designers principal appointed people who actually are going to be managing the the, uh, the building the asset when it's uh, uh, completed the building safety act has got a number of gateways uh, associated with it um which fundamentally are about handing the correct information over to the correct people at the right time and then demonstrating that you've got the right competent people delivering on that information and that design and that standard that you said you were going to deliver on in achieving the building regulations for example so for me the two are very much aligned in terms of ensuring that we've got the right people appointed the right competence, the right information provided, and the right process in place to ensure that the buildings achieve the, the uh, required standards to fundamentally save lives. And if we get quality wrong, and if we don't have a process like 99001, 9001 to achieve that quality, then um, yeah, 
we, we do run the risk of not achieving what the desires of the Building Safety Act are trying to impose on uh, the industry. So they do align, yes. Yes, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and it does remind me back to what must be almost three years ago in January um, next year from when the first conversation mm -hmm. one came about. And um, and it was for those very reasons that you say, and that was you know before we knew what was going to be in the, the, the Building Safety Bill. So. Uh, Adrian, you, you talked about it as part of the panel discussion earlier, and, and you're going through a process at the moment, I, I think, to sort of look at the requirements of, of 99,001 alongside 9,001. Is, is the Building Safety Act playing a part in that thought process at the moment? It, it is. It's being handled by a, a, a separate team of people as a, as a specialist element with, with particular regard to our commercial activities of our, of our business but um, there are people working in, in, in both groups so we are uh, considerate of, of uh, you know, amendments and, and shifts according to, to, to both requirements but as Stefan said there are a lot of similarities between the two so uh, to coin a phrase one, one almost plays off against the other so there are some commonalities in the amendments required uh, again, as Stefan said, around competence uh, and those interested parties, as we've stressed several times this morning. Fantastic. And, and Ian, I suppose to some extent, it's not just something like 99,001 that has this sort of regulatory background to it. You touched on some of the links to government in your presentation. Is that something that, that were part of the discussions you had for iteration one? Um. <clears throat> I think to, to, a, to a degree that the, the concept of, of sort of QA and, and things is, is, is sort of a given. Um, I've, I've been mulling over with it, with this conversation, actually, this thing about you know, that we have too much information and whatever. And, you know, what we're really good at is just continually adding to things that to, to the things that we need to do. And, you know, you go back to, um, I think, Will's first comment, nobody comes to work to do a bad job. So at what point does something um, just become custom and practice and just the, the, the way we do things and therefore you don't need to, uh, to, to to sort of legislate for it anymore and I think we, we, we've we've sort of taken a fresh start in the, in the, in the value toolkit really in, in terms of you know defining well what is it we need to be achieving what what are the outcomes that we need to achieve in a project um, and and you sort of I guess you start to build the framework around that and I think the, you know, there are some things, you know, you know, we've not focused just on the, if you like, the functional delivery. So, you know, we haven't got into the world of, well, what's the structural spec, you know, for functional spec for a school or a, or a road or whatever, you know, because that's stuff that just goes on anyway. This is, this is about, you know, <clears throat> how we're scoping, what we're going to do in the project, what is going to get delivered, and then and then teams go off and so sort of do that. So, so to an extent, and I guess thinking back, it's quite refreshing actually. We've not got into that sort of that whole world of of nine thousand one and ninety nine thousand one, fourteen thousand one. You know, none of that um, and and things because we've just been looking at the scope of well, what is what is it as a client? We, you know, they you want to deliver. Um, and then, and then all of those other bits come in afterwards. Really, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. And just one final thing, which is interesting, that Vasula Vasala um, asked about: Can we get your thoughts about quality conscience, which was a theme of World Quality Week, week this this year? So, I mean, that's a very open question to all of you about a new term. We talk about culture, but now quality conscience. Uh, is is coming up, so I don't know if anybody wants to try and tackle that one before we we close, or we can we can just acknowledge that that, that it's a new it's a new direction of travel. Do we mean awareness, or do we mean a sense of responsibility? I think it's, I, I did have to Google it, if I'm honest, Will. Um, I didn't see that come up during World Quality Week, but it's a state of having an awareness of right and wrong, good and evil. So I mean, I certainly think that that is something that. So when we talked about all the themes today, you definitely need to think about quality conscience, it, it seems. So that might be something that comes up more in your conversations as we go forward. But I won't dwell on that one too much longer as we seem to have run out of time. So uh, it's just uh, finally I'd like to thank all of you again, um, incredibly busy people in your day jobs. Thank you so much for joining us and going through everything that we've gone through this morning and answering all the questions for the, for the audience. Um, I hope uh, it's been useful to everybody. 
as I say, these are the, this is the fourth session um, over the last couple of days. Yesterday was with health and safety and well-being, and then digital, and then quality. This morning we've got modern, modern methods of construction. This afternoon, please do tune into those or get them on on demand. And it's um, just a case of, of letting you all escape to have some some well-earned lunch. And uh, thank you again, and we'll see you all again in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.